All glory to the Lord. Uh, if you can help me to bring this down, would be good. And then the fan also, we, I need the fan, guys. A little bit warm. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Those who don't have the notes, you can share with those having the notes, all right? Because I think uh, if you have the notes, it's easier for you to follow. Uh, that's why you notice that I make full notes so that the notes is not just for you to follow, but also for you to refer in the future. That's very important, huh? for you to refer to the future. Uh, if you don't have the notes now, if you find that the notes are useful, you can inform our sister at the back. Uh, then I can make additional copies uh, uh, for you. Let us just pray. Father, we commit ourselves to you. We ask and pray for the refreshing spirit to come upon each and every one of us. As we learn this very important subject, we pray that the Holy Spirit will be keeping us awake and afresh and that, Lord, the word will come forth with clarity and simplicity. And we always understand that it is not just knowing the word, but it is applying the word in our life. We, we receive the benefits of what you have promised in your word to us. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. All right, let's turn to the page number three. If you have page number three, we start from the beginning. If we can ask you to sit in the front, it's okay. Come to the front easier because I don't have to look out. Yeah, it, it helps me a lot, huh? Just come to the front. It's easier since we have some place. Um, actually, it will help the preacher because at least the preacher can interact much close, uh, closer with you. All right. Unlike our parents, and we all have parents, right? Unlike our parents, parenting in our generation is extremely challenging responsibility because the expectation of children of this generation are remarkably different from us. Isn't that true? All right, I realize that, right? When our parents, our, our, our mindset, our attitude is very different from our children. I think our parents have easier time raising us up, okay? Uh, and we, we means talking about people in our generation, are what we call the sandwich generation. We are the sandwich generation. We are still living in a generation where we are trying to please our parents, but at the same time, we're also trying to please our children. So that's why we call ourselves a sandwich generation. It's very challenging to be parents today in this generation. Now, any failure in parenting may result in serious and unrecoverable consequences, not limited only to our children's generation, but also the future generation. That's why it's very important for us to have knowledge now. Okay? Sadly, parenting seminars are no longer commonly conducted in churches today. Now, even if there are parenting seminar, the church will not teach you on the child brain development. They only teach you about parenting. But I think that is not enough. That is not enough. You need to know how a child developed from the womb to the first five years. Those are very critical years of a child. But people don't teach in church, right? They only teach on parenting, that's all. And they don't even teach you on grandparenting. Because some of us grandparents become the principal caregiver, but they, they never teach you about it. And then they also never teach you how to deal with in-laws and live with in-laws, isn't it? But all these are reality that we all face, but the church is not doing it. And I felt it is so important, and that's why I come out with this particular seminar on marriage, child brain development, parenting, parents-in-laws and daughters-in-law relationship, and then you have grandparenting, which is the full and complete uh, uh, knowledge that we need in our lives. It is my opinion that a parenting seminar is very important because most of us have grown up without good parenting models. Right? I can vouch to, vouch to it, right? My parents are, don't know any better because they also learn from my great grandparents and all kinds of things, right? Uh, they have done the best. Uh, we, don't, we, don't, we, we should not uh, condemn our parents. Uh, they have done their best according to the knowledge that they have. They say knowledge is very important. They say the Bible warns us about the lack of knowledge, remember? Knowledge is very important. I always see the importance of studying. I never stop studying. 
when I want to communicate with my youngest son, who is a doctor, I know uh, uh, Dr. Kwan's children, I will take the trouble to go into the view, YouTube to look at emergency medicine because he's doing emergency medicine. Right? I will go into the YouTube to look at how certain surgeries have been done in emergency situation. Why? So that I can communicate with him. Isn't it? I can communicate with him so that I show him that I'm interested in what you are doing. You understand? Interest is very important. Your children must know that you are interested in them and in what they are doing. All right? It's not like, ah, oh, what are you doing? Oh, okay. No, it's not like that, right? So in that case, you're not developing relationship. Because if you don't have a good relationship, you'll find that the relationship can easily be strained. But don't worry, if you have not developed a good relationship with your children, you can make reconnection. I will tell you how to reconnect with your children, right? Um, I can vouch that many of us parents uh, parent our children through trial and error. I think we also was there. <laughs> Same, huh? Because we never learned. Huh? Nobody teaches us, so we have to use trial and error. Okay? So, I can vouch that many of us parent our children through trial and error and have to concede that we could have been better parents if we were equipped with the necessary skills and knowledge on how to become better parents. Isn't that true? If you have the skills and the knowledge, you will always be better. This would help us to avoid many of the pitfalls and damages we might have caused to our children. So if we have knowledge, we have the skill, all right, we will minimize pitfalls and damage that have caused our children. That means because I know I have a lot of knowledge now, if I'm given another opportunity to bring up my children, I will bring them up in a different way, in a different perspective. But no regret, huh, by the way. Don't look back. You always move forward. Okay? Always go forward. Huh? Don't move back. Scripture is true. God wants Israel that His people perish for lack of knowledge. That is true. A lot of people don't want to study. A lot of people don't want to have knowledge. Actually, you need to. If a person is sick, I give you a practical application. If a person is sick, but if he has no knowledge of the drug that is available to treat him, he will die. Not because the drug is not there. The drug is available, but he does not have knowledge. And so he dies. And that's exactly the same thing that applies to every area of our life when we lack knowledge. So that's what the Bible says. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. So the first thing is there are people who lack knowledge. There are people who are totally ignorant. And there are people who have knowledge, but they reject it. You see, he says, you have rejected knowledge. So which means that if I come and tell this person who is sick, I say that, look, you know, I know of a drug that can cure you, but he has this knowledge, but he reject it, he still die. So the Bible is not talking only about lack of knowledge. The Bible also talks about you have knowledge, but you don't believe. You reject it. Okay? And so here it says, Thou hast rejected knowledge. I will also reject you, that thou shall be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget your children. So if you do not know the word of God, you will find that you will struggle in guiding your children in a godly way way which will help them in their future destiny and the future generation because from your children come the next generation all right because i think i've reached to such an age i become more conscious about the importance of generation i last time i never think about it all right but now i start thinking a lot more about it over the last few years since my granddaughter was born i become more conscious so i pray that we will take heed to Hosea's warning. Hosea's warning is true because of my ignorance and my lack of knowledge of God's word and lack of knowledge of how to be a parent, how to be a husband, etc. I have committed many mistakes in my marriage and as a parent, as a father. We all can vouch to that, isn't it? Because we're not perfect. Um, by the grace of God, the mistake I had, I had committed were not serious. Thank God, not serious. Huh? All right? Um, my children turned out reasonably well. 
but they could be better if I had nurtured them in the way of the Lord at a young age. And so we intervene much later. All right, if you are a Christian parent, if you're godly now and your children are born, you have a greater impact and success over them because they are still very young. They are still a very tender bamboo shoot. It's very easy to bend. Okay? Please do not feel condemned. We can still commit our children to God and pray for the Lord to intervene in their lives. Right? So don't feel condemned. Huh? We can pray. God can restore. Right? If the relationship is not very good, God can restore. Huh? So we move forward. We look to God and pray. And I hope this seminar will provide you with the necessary information and knowledge. That's what I can do for you. To give you the necessary information and the necessary knowledge, but I cannot help you. You need to help yourself. Okay? Uh, to become a better parent and grandparent. Okay? Now, we need to start with the first one, understanding a child's brain and emotional development. That's very important. And people don't study it. People don't know it. And I've learned it. I've, be, I've become aware that it's so important for every parent should know about this. Okay? Now, most of the information in this particular section is drawn from research and studies conducted by Harvard University, Duke University, and MIT in US, and video information by Dr. Gabor, Matty, and many others. That means I spent a lot of time reading uh, articles written uh, and research done by this university, and also Dr. Gabor Matty. Now, you can type Dr. Gabor Matty in the YouTube. A lot of his teachings are very useful. Very useful. Okay? Um, so, it is worth reading. Huh? Like the one I put in there, there for you, you need to go and read yourself. Because I cannot do everything there. You've got to read yourself. Something you have to do your own. Before we study parenting, it is foundational that we must try to understand babies Toddlers and young children, isn't it? I mean, you want to become a parent, but you know if you want to be a parent means you must have baby before you become parent, ma, and therefore you need to understand how baby develop, how baby grow, ma. That's very important. Okay? So that's why we study this first and not parenting. Okay, you, are, you cannot be a parent without a child, right? All right? We should gain, and I use the word should, we should gain as much knowledge about babies, toddlers, and young children, Dr. Kwan, can I have the fan on? It's a, a bit warm. Thank you so much. All right. We should gain as much knowledge about babies, toddlers, and young children, either, so there are ways we can gain knowledge, either to reading books, you can buy books, or attending seminars like this, or viewing videos before you become a parent. That is my advice to you. Now, this applies to every area of your life. If you want to, uh, want to know more about marriage and all that, you should be reading marriage books. And, but you need to be very careful uh, which book that you are reading. Obviously, some marriage books are not good, so you need to be extremely careful with it. Not every book. You need to vet through the book, make sure that they are godly. Okay? So, so I'm going to skip Hosea 4, 6. I've mentioned that. The knowledge gained will equip us to be better parents and grandparents. A child is a gift from God. It is not yours. It doesn't belong to you. It's a gift from God. Okay? Babies are born not having done any good or evil. They are pure in a sense because they are not being corrupted. When they are born, they are not being corrupted. Although they have the sin nature in them, a rebellious nature in them, they have not been able to be influenced by environment. Okay? So Romans chapter 9 verse 11 is very clear. God says, For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil. And so that's why when you look at the issue of babies when they are stillborn, 
children or babies when they die young, do they go to heaven? I believe they do because the Bible says they are born not with evil and things like that. They will. Okay? I say, oh, they, you, they cannot go because they not accept Christ. No, right? When accepting Christ is when you reach a certain age of maturity to decide. A child does not come from you, but God. That's very important. So it's belong to God, not belong to you. So what you need to do is your responsibility is to nurture the person to fulfill God's purpose, not your purpose. Some parents force their children to become doctors. And then when they are studying, they are struggling, they cannot. Halfway through, they don't want to become doctors as well. I come across that. I, I, I actually, I graduated as a civil engineer, but I don't want to become a civil engineer. I actually wanted to be a doctor. But because my parents are, my parent was a contractor, so as an elder son, ah, you know, that's the wrong thinking. Lah. This is an old Chinese thinking got to be erased. So I did not fulfill my desire, but my son fulfilled his desire. So when my son finished his medical study, I told him, I said, I'm going, I'm going to start my medical study. I'm going to go to Philippines to do it. It's only costing 300,000 ringgit. And my son was telling me, when you finish, you'll be 60 years old. And then why don't you keep the place for the younger people? Why are you going to take it? <laughs> anyway, uh, so that's why I'm saying that babies are from God and babies are to, we are to nurture them to fulfill God's purpose, not your purpose. All right? A lot of Asian parents are different, you know. They decide what their children want to do. A lot, I'm not saying all, a lot of them. And sometimes some parents don't know what the children want to do also. That is also a problem. All right, so we need to know. Parents are privileged that God gave the child through you. So it's a privilege. That God entrusts the child to you, you know. Actually, that's a privilege, right? How many of you want to entrust your child to somebody? If they entrust, if you entrust your child to somebody, I'm sure as a parent, you know that this person you can trust, that they will know how to take care of your child, isn't it? So that's an honor, it's a privilege that God gave to us. That's why sometimes some people want children, they cannot have children. Isn't it? Because it's up to God, you know, it's not up to them. Alright? And some people adopt children. Yeah, sorry. Correct. I know. I know. So, I have come across that. Yeah. It's, 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 yeah. Uh, because this, because the children of this generation are influenced by humanism, they are selfish. Actually, they, they do it because they are selfish. They want their own life. Because the moment you have children, when I deal with it, you understand that, yeah, 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 yeah. Your generation. That's very traditional. That's very traditional thinking, lah. I mean, that's very traditional thing, not only to Chinese, but to Indian also the same, to Asian, but not to Westerners. Yeah. 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 That's why, they, that's why we say they don't have sense. Ma. Sing, ma. Sing is sense, but they don't have sense. So, so anyway, uh, this is very Asian thinking. To the Westerners, they don't have this kind of thinking. And unfortunately, a lot of our children being exposed to Western thinking. I have one grandchild. She's four years old. But I've been telling my son to have another one. They say they don't want. <laughs> All right? So, so the issue is this. If we keep pressing, they begin to strain the relationship. So we have to, because it's their children, it's their life. So we have to just leave it as it is. And so that our relationship are not hampered. Lah. Yeah. 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 So, so I think at the end of the day, our children generation are very different from us, and we just have to, we just have to make sure that if sons are, if your sons are, we just have to make sure that our children get the right wife lah. Sometimes the son want the wife don't want ma. Right? Sometimes the wife want the son don't want ma. So I have this situation. I have a close friend who actually told the son, why don't you have another one? He was one, one daughter. So, uh, 
Uh, I mean, it's good to interact. No, no issue. Uh, if you have anything, please. Because that's the way to keep the seminar alive, okay? Don't worry about it. Uh. Don't worry about time. If I'm tired, I will sit down and teach. It's okay. Don't worry about it, all right? So, he's got a son. He told the son, you know, one is not enough. At least you must have two. For me, the ideal number is three. To me, uh, ideal number is three, okay? So, he told the son, you know, why don't you have another one? And then he told the daughter-in-law, the daughter-in-law one, the son don't want. Okay? In my case, I talk to my son, my son don't want, but I never talk to my daughter-in-law because we're very sensitive. Something you don't want to talk, you talk to your son, don't talk to your daughter-in-law. <laughs> okay? So you get the message from your son to the wife. This is where you have to understand relationship. When you have relationship, you have daughter-in-law and all the in-law relationship is never taught in the church. It has to be taught. It's very important because it can destroy family relationship from one generation to another generation. You need to be taught how to become a parent-in-law. You need to be taught how to become a daughter-in-law or a son-in-law. It's very important. If you don't stay together, it's not too bad. But if you stay together, it's very important. But even if you don't stay together, it's still bad if your relationship is no good. Have you heard of a Chinese saying, Ma, no matter how good your son is, right, the one who really decides on how the relationship is the daughter-in-law, not the son. And nowadays, have you seen that when they go on holiday, you notice that the daughter will, the daughter-in-law will bring her mother, but your son will never bring you. <laughs> you notice that? I mean, that's very bad. It's terrible nowadays, you know. It's very bad. So it is actually it is what the Bible tells us that the woman is usurping authority in the last days. See, a lot of leaders now are women, you know. They're using stripping. That's what the Bible wants us. Okay? Now, let me continue. Huh? A child does not belong to you. Having a child is a 25-year project if the child turns out well. However, it's a lifelong project if the child turns wayward. If the child turns out well, it's 25 years finished. You know what to do. But if the child don't turn out well, it's for your whole life. Uh, you'll be worried. So to have a child also is not so easy. Some people just have child children only. And they think that, you know, tin sang tin yong. <laughs> All right, like, you know, you, when the child is born, I let heaven take care. I decide in a way, you know. You know what I'm trying to say? Okay, so remember, having a child, if the child turns out well, it's a 25-year project. But if the child does not turn out well, it's a lifelong misery. So that's very important for us. Each child, remember, especially Asian parents, uh, whether Indian or Chinese, this is typical. Uh, each child is uniquely created by God for his purpose. You don't have your child for your purpose. You know, in the old time in China, they have a lot of children. Why? They have a lot of children because most of them are farmers. So they need hands to work in the farm. So they have the child for their purpose. No. Each child is unique, created by God for God's purpose. And we need to know, that's why we need to know the child's character, attributes, giftings and all that. Because we are there as parents to develop him to fulfill God's purpose. A lot of Asian, as I say, is their purpose. Lah. All right? Some, you know why some people want their children to be doctors? Pride. Wow, my children doctor, my children doctor, my children doctor, you know. Do you mean engineer no good? Ah? Uh, the worst is, if their children very good, doctors, lawyers, engineer. Children no good, pastors. <laughs> Do you know that in the church saying is like that? Uh, the good one is doctor, la, lawyer, la, engineer. La, but no good one, give to God. La. Become pastors. Okay? Now, remember this. The giftings and talents God placed in a child are sufficient to accomplish God's purposes for his life. That means we as parents must know what they are and then develop the giftings and develop the talents. The same thing applies in the church. When you're in the church, you have a certain gifting and certain talents. You need to use your talent and gifting. Alright? Because why? You need to fulfill your purpose. Alright? Don't sit in the church and do nothing because you have giftings and talents. Alright? So in the church, contribute. Then you develop more talents, more giftings, ma, because that's what the Bible says. Ma. 
you reap what you sow. You don't sow, you don't reap. So if you have 10% of gifting, you never use it. Instead of 10%, it can be less at all. All right, I'm talking about developing character. There's a seminar called Conquering Attitude. Developing Attitude is very important. We don't teach it in the church. I do it in the church. It's called Conquering Attitude. Because in life, your success in life depends on attitude. All right, not how much you know. It's your attitude. I mean, what you know is important. But your attitude determines how far you can go. Because your attitude depends on your altitude. Depend on PR. We don't teach on PR. PR is very important. It's not very important in life. You can be very smart, but you got no PR. Nobody wants to go around you. See, they're all very important. And you can see the wisdom in a person. You can see the wisdom in a child also. Okay? So, according to studies conducted by Harvard University, MIT, and Duke University, the brain development of the child is affected by the following. Take note. If you are not a parent yet, I hope there are more young people here, but it's okay. Number one, the environment in the womb when is when the brain begins to develop. Okay? I'm saying, according to the studies by Harvard University, MIT, Duke University, the brain development of the child or the baby is affected by, number one, the environment in the womb when the brain begins to develop. Number two, the food and drink and drugs consumed by the mother during pregnancy. There are parents who were not wise taking some drug and causing deformation in the child. Isn't it, uh, uh, Dr. Kwan, right? So you have to be very careful in the food you eat and the drug you take. These are very important. A good ONG uh, will be someone who will always keep you uh, abreast with all the drugs that you are taking. So, but some of them just interested in your money, they don't care. Because the more they talk to you, uh, the less patient they see. All right? Number three, the physical and emotional environment in its formative years are very important. What are the greatest gifts parents can give to their children? Some people say money. No. The greatest gift that you can give to your children is happiness. Because happiness talk about environment. Because environment is very critical when a child grows up. What environment the child is in. Okay. First, we want to look at babies are not born with a blank slate. So people think that when the baby is born, it's a blank slate. They know nothing. It's not true. It's not true. Okay? It used to be taught that babies are born with a blank slate that you can write anything you desire. Research has now debunked that. What is true is babies are born with incredible potential for self-realization and self-negation. Now, I'll give you an example. When a mother is pregnant and you play certain music, it calms the baby, right? When the baby is born and the baby is crying, you play the same music that the baby grow in the womb, it calms the baby. Because whatever sounds and things you're doing is being registered in the brain that is being developed. That's what research has shown. All right, and that's why uh, a lot of modern parents, what they do, I told my grand, my told my daughter-in-law the same. You know, play uh, classical music. Classical music is very soothing, very peaceful. You know, and then also hear things that are good, whatever it is. This, these are very important, right? Parents need to manage their stress and seek support during pregnancy and the growing up years of the child if required because of serious impact on the brain development of the child. So if the mother is in stress, if the environment in the house is stress, work is stress, it can create uh, toxicity in the womb. Okay? Number two, attachment patterns are multi-generational. So number one is a child are not born with a blank, blank snake, uh, slate. Huh? He already start picking up information and things in the brain as they grow. Number two, attachment patterns are multi-generational. What does it mean? And this is very important. The attachment is the one that helps me to deal with my granddaughter. 
that I don't need to use a cane because of attachment. Okay, what do I mean by that? Why is a child aggressive? It is when the greatest need of the child is not met. Why does the child cry? When he's hungry, he cries. Oh, you, you wait some more, he cries more and more, right? So the child's need is not met. That's human, you know. And then he says, why you cry? You know, you know, but you don't understand because the child has a need, he's not met. That's why the child cries. That's why the child can get angry. If I take something from you that you like, you get angry or not? You get angry. Right? So a baby is like you, ma. When they want something and you take it away, he get angry. Right? But the problem for us is that we try to scold the child and make sure the child suppress his anger. But do you know the right way to do is not to suppress the anger, is to teach the child how to regulate his anger, to control his anger, not suppress. When you suppress, you cannot control. So how do we learn to regulate? These are things I never learned. Nah. But only when I start reading all these articles, I begin to understand, hey, these are so important. Okay, you don't control, but you regulate. And you teach the child to regulate, teach the child to control his anger. Sure, he's angry. Uh, if you want to take away his toy from him, you think the child not angry. If the child not angry, something wrong with the child. Uh. Alright, so naturally, uh, so we need to learn how to teach the child to regulate. Okay, let's go on. I just sum a little bit, but I'll let you know. Now, it is when the greatest need, do we make better for him when we punish him or when we separate from him? There are two ways of teaching the child. One way is you punish him. Punish him means suppress, la, scared, la, fear, la, he's not going to develop. Or, or separate. Separate means you just turn away, you don't say anything. Because the child can pick up something or no. All right, so when my, my, if, my, if I find that my granddaughter is not behaving, uh, I don't scold her, I just turn away. I don't say anything to her. And then she will look at me and then she will say, Kong Kong, are you happy? She won't say angry because there are certain words we don't want to speak in the house. One. All right, angry. La. Sometimes I hear my, my, my daughter-in-law because she never attend my seminar. Ma. <laughs> I ask her to read, don't know whether to read or not. Nah. Never use words like, Angry la, useless la. No, she is a positive. I say, are you happy? I say, I'm not happy. Then I say, because you're doing this. And then she learned to control. She changed to make me happy. Why? Because children want attachment and relationship. This is very important to them because they cannot survive without attachment and children cannot survive without attachment and relationship. So you don't have to use your cane to whack. All I need to do is don't want to say anything to her. Then she can feel it already. Kung Kung not happy. Then she... What do you do? She regulate la. She controls. Oh, I change la. Because Kung Kung not happy. I want to be Kung Kung. See la. So that's how we do it. But Chinese people, what do they do? Ah, no, no. Ah, ah. It's all wrong way. And then some people will tell me, hey, pastor, the Bible says, spare the rod, kill the child. Now you know the word rod is not cane. Huh? The word rod is discipline, not cane. Alright, and I learned this recently also, by the way. I've been teaching people use the rod, king, king, king. Huh? You don't have to cane. You don't have to cane, but there are times that you may need if your child is very stubborn. Uh, the because it send, send a brain wave to the brain. Then the brain begins to think, ah, you can do that. But you don't have to cane. It depends on the child. Some child needs caning because some are more stubborn than others. That means not one size fits all, you know. You need to understand the child. But you cannot keep beating the child. But I think a lot of time is that you did not learn to develop when they are young how to regulate and maintain, you see. Because when you reach a certain age, you cannot do already. So the first five years become very important, right? So let, let us go on, or else I don't know what time I'm going to finish. All right. So, all right. Do we make it better for him when we punish him or separate from him? Are these actions that we're going to do help his frustration or does he need us more at the point and to intervene more positively and lovingly? To respond positively and lovingly, we must overcome our emotion because we are also frustrated. That's why when parents are frustrated, there's a problem. Because the frustration begins to be shown and the child pick up the frustration. Alright, so when parents are under stress, you know the children will be under stress because they're living in a stress environment. If you work in an office that is under a lot of stress, you also under stress, right? So that's why the home environment is very, very important. Okay? 
So the harder you push the child, the more he automatically pushes back. That is when they reach a certain age. Lah. When they are baby, you're okay. They, they will start, I will tell you what age they will start to say no to you. When they're baby, you cannot say no. But what age will they say no to you? Right? Roughly, the age is one and a half years. The harder you push, the more he automatically pushes back. We see the child starting to push back at about one and a half years old. He demonstrated by saying no. Everything, no. That, that's a pushback. That means you want him to do something, he doesn't want it, he will say no. So he start to push back. Okay? Then what do you need to do? There are two ways to do, ma. No, I want you. It's no. Or how do you find other ways to get him to do things, even though he doesn't like it? But that is smarter, you know. You need brain to think about it, right? To hit the child, only brain, right? Just hit and the child follow you, but it never develop the child. Okay? Put on your shoe, you tell them, put on your shoe. No. Eat your breakfast. No. Have you heard that? You don't have to teach the child to say no. Huh? The first thing he says is no. Okay? The reason why the child say no, the reason why the child need is that the child needs to be an individual. The child has to grow up to be an individual. The child cannot grow up as a robot because every time you tell him you follow, he's a robot. The child must grow up as an individual. How to show an individual when you have your own mind? Saying no is her own mind. That's why he is. I want to say no. That's him. Okay? So it's not bad to allow the child to say no. It is how to teach the son to move from no to yes. And willingly do it. Not by force. Alright, let me just share with you something. Because uh, in, this, in this seminar today, I'm not dealing with conflict resolution. In the whole seminar, I deal with conflict resolution. Let me just share with you. Uh, conflict is a reality. Marriage has conflict. Family has conflict. Office has conflict. Business has conflict. Church has conflict, right? I know some people have got conflict. I don't want to go to this church. I go to another church. Unless everybody is dead there, lah, then there's no conflict. But there's a conflict, right? So in everything in life, there's conflict. What is the, what is the solution? is you learn how to manage and resolve the conflict. But again, you never thought, ma. You don't know how to manage, ma. All right? Let me just give you a final answer to help you. No conflict can be accomplished without compromise. No, no ah. But compromise is not a coerced compromise. If it's a coerced compromise, that solution is temporary. I call it a willing compromise. If there is a willing compromise, your conflict can be resolved. But if it's a coerced compromise, right, the, con the, the conflict is only temporary because afterwards it will come out again. So, but these are things that we don't learn. Church don't teach, you know. You need to learn because these are reality we face, okay? So, the child cannot simply absorb, absorb the will of the parent. Only Robert does that, a robot. But individual, no, isn't it? The child can, you cannot teach the child to just accept everything you say. He becomes a robot. And then when you don't tell him what to do, he doesn't know what to do. And there are parents like that. When they look at parenting model, there are parenting like that. Who the child don't know what to do, waiting for a Now, I can give an example. When you are work, when I was working as a general manager in charge of people, I know the the when I look at some of my, my employees, I know how they are brought up. Those people who are not proactive are grow up in a family where everything the parents say they follow. So they have no proactive thinking on. They wait until somebody tell him to do, then he do. But this is because of the way he's brought up. All right? There's one parenting model. That's what it is, you know. Everything, you know, even when they go to university, the father must drive him. Or father must drive her. I mean, come on. Okay? So, the children, the child cannot simply absorb the will of the father or parents. He needs to become a self functioning and self-respecting individual. He needs to develop his sense of meaningful purpose, have a good understanding of the world, form his own opinion, communicate his desires and needs, and assert his personality. But the Chinese and Asian have this problem. Because we too much control our children. Everything is, the dad say yes means yes. Oh, no, nothing, nothing. So that's why if you look at the 
Nobel Prize winners are how many Asian? Very few. Because they have not been brought up with an environment of creativity and innovation. We put this very important in the growing up of my granddaughter. Innovation, creativity is very important. And we can see it in her life now. We can see one. Okay? It can be some of the fruits we can see. How does the child do that? By counter view. How does the child develop his meaningful purpose, his opinion, his desires by counter view? That means resisting you. Lah. You tell him to do everything you tell him to do. He don't want that because that's individuality. But because he doesn't know what is good for them, we are there to teach them, not to stop them, to teach them how to manage. Okay? Page six. When he learns to say no, he will also learn to say yes. It can, it's not always no. He will also learn to say yes. He knows when to say yes. He knows when to say no. When he already have an understanding and you begin to develop the child. He knows when to say yes. He knows when to say no. If you teach the child properly, he knows that if he put his hands on the boiling water, he will not do it. Because what? Education and knowledge. You don't tell the child, oh, don't, don't, don't touch it. But you must tell the child, you don't touch the boiling water because it's very hot. It will burn your hand. Then the child has understanding. Because when you say no, the child has no understanding. And the child says that, hey, this one must be very interesting. Uh, why? Grandpa, don't let me touch. You see, not? You see, not? So it's not just telling the child no, but explaining to the child the reason behind it. And what will be the consequences if it is disobeyed? You see, that's important. So that they won't disobey you because they know the consequences. A lot of, you see, a lot of parents are so busy most of the time. All right? Isn't true? Let's be honest. A lot of us are busy all the time. We don't have the time. And that's why a lot of young people don't understand that the grandparents can play a very important role. Because we are not so busy as the parents, isn't it? Unless you're still working, lah, I don't know, you know? Or unless you still want more and more and more and more, lah, I don't know. That's up to you, you see? You must have a balance where you want to place in your next generation. I have friends who tell the children straight away, oh, your children is your children, we're not going to take care. I have friends who tell that. And then I have friends who tell me, that, oh, why you can take care of your children, your grandchildren, because it's their responsibility, ma, you have your own life. But, uh, but they, don't see, they don't see what I see. Ma. Because I have more time for my grandchildren, I have more time to teach my, my granddaughter and all that. But they don't see it. Why? Why, why do they say that? It's their, their own life. Uh, I have my own life now. No, 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 no. Even as grandparents, if your grandchildren are not doing well, you think you're happy? No. So that's why people don't understand, you see. All right? We don't want to condemn them. The only thing is because the lack of knowledge, again, is lack of knowledge. Man. They don't understand. All right? Uh, let me continue. Uh, so before he can learn to say yes, he must know how to say no. The child knows what he says yes to and what to say no to. As you begin to understand, he can say oh yes and no. Through understanding, through knowledge. The child begins to learn his individuality around two years old. As you begin to see already. The pushback is starting to happen already. You tell her to do something, she don't like it. That's individual, no? He's individual, his decision. So, but you don't destroy it. You must know how to teach them how to manage it. The purpose of is to develop the child's individuality. The way to manage counter will of the child is not through bribery, which most parents use, unfortunately, isn't it? Ah, oh, I don't know. No, I don't know. Okay, okay. You don't do that. If I, I buy this one for you, uh, then you, you do. You're okay now. Okay. That's bribery. How long can you use by bribery? Bribery is only temporary, you know. Sometimes you can use it, but you cannot use it all the time. Right? And my granddaughter bargains with me, you know. She knows how to bargain. When she's watching something on the YouTube and she's interested, I say, it's time now. You've been watching too long. Then she say, just one more, is it okay? Just one more, is it okay? But if we say no, she will follow. Right? Sometimes we see halfway, the grandmother always halfway let her finish. I say, okay, let her finish. Then you say, okay, I finish this uh, and then no more, okay? You see, it's, it's not. It's just some people think that, you know, they cannot see YouTube, they cannot see this. Actually, you're foolish. She learned so much from the YouTube. So much from the YouTube, actually. But you need to manage and you need to control. Okay? 
So the way to manage the counter will of the child is not through bribery, which most parents use, unfortunately. I will give you this if you obey. And this is a form of coercion, you know. It's a form of coercion. Then if you don't give, uh, then the child will play you, isn't it? Every time you play tantrum, you get things. You play tantrum, you get things, right or not? So that is the wrong way. You can do it occasionally, but it cannot be a habit. If it becomes a habit, you have a problem. And you need to be wise when to use bribery. Yeah, sometimes you need to. I know a, a lot of parents, what they do? Uh, SPM coming. We do. Every 1A you get, I give you 300. They use, they use the word called motivation. Motivation. I mean, it's not bad. You have to be very careful. All right? I never use motivation for my son because every A he gets, he gets nothing. Also. All right? The only thing I say, if you, want to, if you want to be a doctor, you need how many A's? That's all. I never tell him you must have all A's, 10 A's, 11 A's. Never. We never do that because education is one small bit of child development. Some parents put it as the most important thing. A person can be very smart, but if he's useless in his PR, it's no use. You see? So it has to be what we call an overall development. Every aspect of his life, you must train them to handle people, to know what to say, when to say. These are all very important things that you need to do. See, I ne we never put, for us, my wife and I, we never put pressure on our children. They never go for tuition. I'm not saying tuition is bad, huh, please. They never go for tuition. Why? If they're already getting 90 marks, why for go for tuition? You want 100 marks all the time. Huh? You know what I'm saying? Huh? You can have tuition, but if they're weak, send them for tuition. But they have a good enough, you don't need to because they also have life to develop. Not just tuition, not just study in life. You know what I'm saying? But there are some students who are weak. Yeah, you can do that. As I'm saying, not, tuition is not bad, but some parents are different. They already get 95, 95, 95, still go for tuition. See, you know, because their, their friend's son got 98, he couldn't get 95. Ma. So they use competition between parents. And I see that also among my, my, my daughter-in-law. I see the same thing. You know? Her friend's children go to this, or they want to go to this. I say, why? All child is different. Ma. Not every child is to be a doctor. If every child to be a doctor, then we have a problem going to a restaurant because nobody cook for you. You understand? Each of us are different. Some can be lawyers, some can be engineers, but find out what God has called them to be. Every career is important. You understand? If everybody is a pastor, then nobody is sitting there. Come on. So you, you have to understand, you know, develop them as God has for them in their life, their purpose. They fulfill their purpose. So you build... Uh, so the counter will is managed when the child, okay? This is very important. Huh? But the counter will of the child is managed when the child wants to connect with you because the relationship mitigates the oppositionality. That means that you're not happy with what the person is doing. My, say, I'm not happy with my, my granddaughter is doing. I walk away or I just sit away and I don't say anything. She can feel it because they want you, they want a relationship. Children want relationship. And if you don't have the relationship, they feel lost, you understand? And so because they feel lost, they see you're not happy, they manage, they change. Oh, I'm not happy, I don't want to do it. You see, now, so they willingly manage and regulate, you understand? A few cases like that, I was just yesterday or the day before, uh, I was not happy that my granddaughter was saying, Kung Kung, you're not happy. See? Right, so this is very important. We Asians don't do that. We always came out, work, la, go, la, shout. La. I think we should not have shouting in the family. It should stop. And my grand granddaughter don't like people to shout. When you talk loud, my granddaughter will tell you, so noisy, keep quiet, don't say so much. <laughs> you understand? Because, that's what, because we, the environment that we have developed is, is not this kind of environment. When the mother was talking to the father in the kitchen, uh, we, we noticed when the father was talking to the mother, in the, uh, uh, the mother was talking to the mother, but actually, the mother's voice was very loud. Very loud, as though it's scolding, you know. And my granddaughter don't like it. So what my granddaughter did, she went to the kitchen, you know, take the father, you know, he says, let's get out of here, very noisy. You, you understand? So she doesn't like, because she's not grown up with this kind of environment. 
And many times it's like that. You know, when you talk too loud. Some of you Kungu, you are too loud when I talk to my mother very loud. She thinks I'm scolding my mother because my mother is slightly deaf. Ma. She Kungu, you are very loud, very noisy. Then I have to explain to her. He says, uh, uh, Potai, Potai, we heard Potai's great grandmother, right? She's a little bit deaf, so I need to be very loud. You understand? So the environment becomes very important. She picks up a lot of things. All right? So you build relationship to mitigate resistance. The solution is not fewer relationship, but more and better quality relationship. You need to spend time. In fact, lately she sticks so close to me in the afternoon when she sleeps. Huh? And before she sleeps, she will come and hug me to sleep together. I sleep with her. The mom's uh, grandma sleeps on one side, I sleep on one side. She will sleep with me. She will come and hug me, put her in, and sleep, and then she will fall asleep. You know what I'm saying? You want to have more quality because that quality relationship builds tremendous confidence in the child. No, very confident. She's very confident. All right? So you see this adult too. Now, if you have good relationship, whatever mistake you make, all right, is you, you don't sense that much, isn't it? But when your relationship is bad, a small dot of mistake becomes very big, isn't it? So even adult is the same. The relationship is very important. Because that determines the conflict level and the solution of the conflict. If your relationship is good, uh, you don't mind, it's okay. You've got a relationship. Okay? So even a child is the same. Relationship is... So when you have a close or intimate relationship, there is less opposition or conflict. Correct or not? Okay? The fundamental dynamics of human life is attachment or relationship. We are born with relationship. That's why God says it's not good for men to be alone because we are creatures of relationship, you see. And the most important factor in the development and existence of human being is attachment with a connection with another human being. That's why it's not good for men to be alone. God created Eve. And because Eve pamper, because Adam pamper Eve, we get into trouble. You see, husband, when you pamper your wife, you always get into trouble. All right? So love is a common word for attachment. Uh, you all say, oh. every parent loves their children. True, every parent, but the problem is many Asian parents don't know how to demonstrate their love. They think that a child knows exactly. No. It's a demonstration of the love. Because love is not an emotion. Love is a demonstration of your life. It's not just an emotion. If you love somebody, you will go out of the way, what? To please the person, isn't it? Could I not? So real love is a demonstration of what is in the heart. Do you know that? For God so loved the world, you know what is the heart of God. Okay? And He proved that He loved us. How did He prove He loved us? By giving His only begotten Son. See, love is not just him. I love you, I love you, do nothing. No, that's not love. That is empty talk. Okay? Love here does not mean the emotion the parent feels towards the children because I take it for granted that all parents love their children. It is hard to phantom, but even parents who abuse their children at the core love their children. Isn't it? Do you know, even... The mafia boss also love their children. He go and send people to kill people. He still love his children. Isn't it? So in general, we all love our children. Sometimes we don't know how to love them. You understand? Sometimes we abuse them. And after you abuse them, what happened after? When you cool down, what happened? You feel terrible in your heart, right? Because of, you don't want to abuse them. But because of the situation, the stress that you are in, you did not control. You see, the problem that we have in life is the problem of managing stress. Sometimes we, you, when you come back after a hard day's work, for example, you come back after a hard day's work and your boss giving you a hard time and you come back to the house and then your child going to play tantrum, what happened to you straight away? You lose control, right? This doesn't mean that you don't love your child. You love, but because you don't know how to manage your emotion and your stress level. And the child suffers because of that. The child is innocent, but it suffers because of that. Okay? Now, it doesn't mean that we don't get angry. As I said, we get angry, but we don't have to use cane. We get angry, we must know how to manage. You're angry with the child, you must know how to manage. Understand? All right? So, 
The sad fact is that they just don't know how to demonstrate love in normal, acceptable way because they are acting out of their childhood programming. Because a lot of our time, especially Asians, uh, we don't, uh, our parents don't demonstrate their affection, isn't it? We know they love, but don't demonstrate their affection. They don't come and hug you and say, hey, I love you. But my granddaughter, you know, they're different. No, my granddaughter said, oh, Kung Kung, I love you. Sometimes he teases the grandmother. Looking at the grandmother with me, she's with me, and looking at the grandmother, he says, oh, Kung Kung, I love you more than anything in the world. He says, it's going, you know? And then the grandmother says, what about women? And he quickly says, oh, I love you also. See? The affection. Affection creates confidence. And Chinese people don't have much affection, right? Do you know that one of the things men never learn, Chinese men never learn, is every woman, whether they are black, white, yellow, or green, they love affection. Do you know that? Isn't it true now? You just hug your wife, they feel very good, as though they're in, top, in the hill top, you know, or the mountain top. <laughs> the way you want to get your wife to do something for you is called affection. Because women are created for affection. They are very gentle. They are very, uh, what's the word? Huh? They are very, not very gentle. There's one word, fragile. Women are very fragile. When I put my hand into my, I put my hand around my wife, she start to break it. Ring, 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 ring. <laughs> then if I want anything, very easy. So you don't have to shout your, to your wife to get things. You know, All you need to do is affection. A woman who feels affection, feels secure, feels love, they can do anything for you. Okay? I know my wife will die for me, but I don't know whether to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you understand? So a child needs affection. Affection is a very powerful uh, chemical build up in your body. A lot of difference. But some some husbands don't show affection on you know. Because woman, woman wants affection. You have to understand that. So you must learn to be affectionate. Okay? But obviously, don't overdo it. Lah. All right. So, by your love, I don't mean by your emotion, nah, by your love. I mean the capacity to be present with and to understand and see the other human beings for exactly who they are and to accept them and invite them unconditionally to be in your presence exactly the way they are. You don't want them, you just accept the way they are. All right? And then they will change. You know, I've come across uh, people with marital problems. They always want their, their spouse to change. They think they are the perfect one. No, no. It's quite common, you know. Oh, you know, he's like that, like that, like that, like that. They are the perfect one. They expect them to change. I say when you change your perspective on the other party, the other party in your eyes will start changing because your perspective changed. Okay? So that's what, what is love is. When children don't receive unconditional invitation to be in your presence exactly the way they are, then they must adapt to that. For example, I'll give you an example. A lot of people don't understand. I'm using my own experience because actually if I share with you my own experience, then you know what I'm talking is not just picking something from the air. It's real. A lot of children, a lot of parents, sometimes they don't understand that they seem to be insecure with grandparents. When, when their children become so attached to the grandparents, they become very insecure. And then they don't realize that they are their children, we are only grandparents. Even though we help to take care, it's not for long term, isn't it? At the end of the day, they still follow the parents. Why you feel so insecure? And they feel insecure. I think one time, my granddaughter, I was holding my granddaughter and she came back, she wanted to the, the, hold the daughter, the daughter refused. Okay? What do they do? They snatch. Uh, but they don't realize that. If, you see, these are things that a lot of people don't realize that. When you stretch my granddaughter away, if I don't do anything, what is she feeling in her mind? Kung Kung don't want me anymore. Right now. Right now. So I told my daughter, no, I said, you cannot do that. I will talk to her and reason with her, and then she will go. True enough, I take back, and then after that, I reason with her, I tell her, and then she willingly go to the mother. You don't snatch a child out of the hand of the grandparent or vice versa. 
And if I don't go, then the child will feel rejection. Don't want me anymore, is it not? But if I go, then she may misunderstand, you see? So this is the problem sometimes. Again, it's lack of knowledge. They don't understand. You don't snatch it. Because, because you know why? The child has one problem. And the dangerous problem is insecurity. When they feel insecure. All right? So that's very important. You don't do that. You can reason with the child. And then I can talk to the child. And after that, the child will go to the mother. See? Don't snatch. So that's the wrong way of doing things, huh? Uh, all right. So why do children need to adapt? Because they need attachment relationship without which they cannot survive. Because children cannot live. Only human beings are the only creatures. They need many years to be independent. But animals is very fast, right? They can be independent. But human beings cannot. So they need a number of years to be independent. Because they need attachment. Without attachment, there is no survival. If you leave the child on its own, it will die. Guarantee you. It will die. So they need attachment. They need relationship. So therefore, there is a need to adapt. Even the child will also learn to adapt. But when they're too young, they cannot. I'm talking about at least when they reach two years old. They will also need to learn how to adapt. Do you know that when a child grows up in an abusive environment, the child needs to learn to adapt. If not, the child will die. God has created within us the capacity to adapt in life, you know. You see, now you can see when the child, they will know when they come back, if the father is very abusive, the child can be playing, then when the father starts coming, the child going to hide. What does it mean? Adapt. The child says, I better go and hide. If not, I will get beaten again. You see, God has created that into a human being for survival. Now, it's very important. So if the child gets a message that he is not invited in your presence when he is angry, then he won't be angry. So he adapt. Kung Kung is not happy. So she adapt because she wants to be with me. She adapt. And adapt is survival, you know. Animals also need to adapt to survive. Okay? Not that the anger won't be there. She's angry. But he regulates. I don't want to use the word suppress. Huh? He regulates it. It is not a conscious behavior, but it's simply an automatic brain mechanism. When you repress anger in the long term, what happens is you are repressing your immune system. A lot of research has shown that the immune system can then fail to function or it can turn against you in the form of autoimmune disease. I don't know whether Dr. Kwan will agree with that. Right? You keep suppressing and toxicity, cortisol build up. You can develop autoimmune disease. All right? That, in a nutshell, is the root cause of a lot of physical illness. Do you know when you're always not happy, you're always very sad, you're always very complaining, you're always murmuring, do you know that you feel sick all the time? Because the Bible tells us what? What is, what do it good like a medicine? A merry heart do it good like a medicine. I know of a friend, he's 80 something years old. Miserable, sick all the time, miserable. Every time complaining and complaining and complaining. How can you be healthy? You live a life of complaining and murmuring. No. Environment is very important. So, that in a nutshell is the root of a lot of physical illness. Not the only source, but it is a major contributing factor that's utterly ignored in Western medicine despite realms of evidence. I think now Western medicine accepted the importance of the stress caused cause diseases. All right? Emotion and biology are inseparable. When you lose emotionally, oh sorry, what you lose emotionally translates into a biological event in your body. Research has shown that attachment patterns of parents are predictively passed on to their children. How you are brought up, and if you don't change it, your children will follow the same thing. Right? You can interview a prospective parent 
a couple of years before the child is born and predict how the yet-to-be-conceived child will respond to attachment issues just by observing his parents' attachment pattern. Before a child is born, you look at the attachment pattern of a couple between a husband and a wife, you will notice that how the child will develop the same pattern because you become the model, ma. You are the model, ma. That's why it's so important, you see. You are the model. So you can predict that child will have the same attachment patterns because the parents' attachment patterns are like that. If the, if the wife keeps calling the husband, right? I mean, just a, a hypothetical case. If the wife keeps ho- scolding the husband and the daughter is growing up, and then when she has a husband, what does she do? She keeps scolding the husband. Because that's the pattern that has been developed. Okay? That's a pattern that has been developed. Okay? The child will grow up and exhibit the same attachment pattern as the, an adult. So it is strongly conditioned by generational emotional attachment transaction in a family. How you relate to your spouse. Because she's watching her. And then as she grow up, they think it's normal. Is it to them? You see, if a husband and wife always argue when they grow up, they have their, they have their spouse. They always argue. Ma, because to them, ma, it's a natural thing. That's what my parents do. Ma. It's a common thing. Ma. But you know, we need to change. Why? Because we don't have knowledge. That's why we don't change. Only knowledge can help us and applying the knowledge can help us to change. Okay? Now, now I'm going to a very important part is a child brain development in response to the environment. Okay? Parents may need to put their life goals on hold and look after their own emotional needs so that they can create the right environment where the child is connected and secure. The right environment is the key ingredient to helping the child to thrive in the future. A human brain is not strictly an organ, but it principally develops not according to genetics, but largely in response to the input from the environment. For example, a seed has a genetic code For the seed to grow, you have to plant the seed in good ground, good family, let's say, and then you need other ingredients such as sunlight, water, fertilizer, and so on. So it doesn't mean that a child grow up in a good family is going to thrive because a good family is the soil. But there are other things that is needed for the child to grow to thrive, just like the seed planted in a good soil doesn't mean that it's going to grow and thrive. You must have sunlight, good ground, no sunlight, it dies, you see? So you have to understand, good ground is important, but there are other factors that contribute to the seed, whether it's going to be productive or not productive. Okay, but the good ground is the basis. The good family is the basis, that's all. With all the optimal conditions, the seed will produce an abundant harvest. Likewise, the human brain also develops in response to the condition of the environment. For example, a child who doesn't see light will be blind after a few years because the visual connections are not developed. See? If you keep a child in the dark for three years, the child will be blind because light is needed to develop certain connections in the brain. You see? That's why it's so important. Especially the human brain. Listen to this. Most of the growth happens in the womb and the first three years of his life. By the end of the third year, and when I read this, I got shocked myself. Huh? By the end of the third year, the child's brain is about 80% of the adult size. That means by the end of the third year, the child's brain is equal to the 80% of your brain. But is it going to be empty or not? I don't know. Because what you input to the brain, the child begins to develop. Ma. If you don't put anything, the child don't develop. Even though he has 80% of the adult brain, is so useless, right? Because you need to put input. Ma. You can have your computer with one, one terabyte, but you don't put data in, it's useless, right? 
So that's why it's very important. The capacity is there. What are you going to fill it? Okay? So, so the first three years are hugely important. My wife and I, we actually decided to take care of my granddaughter to help her for one year, but they are now continue to be four years. Uh, we are happy with that. We have no issue. We are happy with that because the first three years is very important. And actually, I wanted to look at the first five years. Now she's uh, four years plus. By next year, she'll be the fifth year. We will hand back to the parents. Okay? Because at least the first five years, we have been able to put the right input for her already, the first five years. Okay? So the first three years is hugely important. In other words, a baby's capacity for intimate relationships, connections, self-regulation, attention, stress regulation is directly shaped by the emotional availability of the parent or the grandparent, whoever is a major caregiver. During the critical first three years, the right conditions need to be met for healthy brain development. Babies need caregivers who are not stressed, not depressed, emotionally stable, and consistently available. Now, why we do not want to, uh, my grandchildren to send to some ama to take care? I'm not saying that it's wrong to send ama to take care. It's our own decision. Eh? It's because in general, if the ama takes care, the child is not going to learn as much as we taking care. You get the point? A lot of the ama sometimes, they don't only take care of one, they take care of three, they take care of four. And most of the time, they give them cough medicine so they can sleep. Yeah, maybe take a break. Let me just finish taking a break. So we decided, uh, I'm not saying that if you don't, uh, you're no good. Uh, and I'm not saying that, right? It is our decision because we understand the importance of it. So we are willing to do that. And like my wife gave up her profession to take care of the child. Some may not be able to do so. So we don't condemn people to say that, oh, why don't you give up your job? To take care? No, it's up to the individual. We can do it because I was earning enough, more than enough to provide. I mean, if you cannot, then you have to be real, realistic, right? You cannot tell somebody, say, hey, you need to take care of your children. It's only 2,000 per month. You cannot survive. They take care. So, so you have to look at situation. We are not there to condemn people, but we are there to tell people, if you can, that is a better option. But sometimes, the perfect option doesn't happen all the time. All right? But there are sometimes, there are some parents are unwilling to give up their career. So that is also true, isn't it? They are not willing to. I think you give up your law practice, is it? So, but he can afford life, you cannot afford also, you cannot, right? So, so we don't want to condemn people, but we want to encourage people, understanding that if the parent themselves take care, or if the grandparent them take care, then it's slightly different uh, in terms of development, okay? So, uh, I finished this part, then I will. In other words, okay, all right. Basically, babies and toddlers require a stable and low-stress environment. All right, so we're going to look at how the fetus develop into a full-grown baby after a break. Okay, after a break. Well, Five-minute break, ten-minute break, five-minute break, five-minute break. Okay, go and stress out yourself and all that.
I just want to have your response. Do you find this helpful? Yeah? And do you feel that how you wish you had known this before that, right? Yeah. All right? Ah. Uh, no, it, it's not too late. Lah. It's not too late. It's not too late. Huh? It's not too late. I will tell you it's not too late. Huh? We will know what to do. Huh? Ah, then you, you become grandparent. Lah. Don't worry about it. Yeah. No, no, no. It depends on how you... you see, it's relationship. How you manage your relationship. You see, if I want to... If both of us want to take care of our grandchildren... Ah. 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 That's why you need to. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. That's why. That's why you need to listen to what I'm teaching on grandparenting. You see, you know, because grandparenting has its peculiar ways. Uh, parents and grandparent parenting is different. You cannot use the same. Uh, you cannot use the same. It's different how you approach this relationship. Now, at the end of the day, as I said, we are willing, but at the end of the day, it's whether my daughter-in-law is willing or not. She may say no, but if she say no, then we are free. Lah. Then we are free. Lah. I mean, if she say yes, I mean, we're supposed to, I, I, we, told, we told her, so, I mean, as I share with grandparents, I share with you lah, how to manage, how to talk to your, your, your daughter-in-law and your son, what to do, what to say and all that, you know. So, we see how it goes lah, because we give, we, when we talk to them, we give them three options lah, it's up to them to choose lah. Alright, let's go on now. Else. Now, I'm dealing with a part that's very important lah, because it's from the womb, lah, from conception now, I'm going to talk about what you, we need to do lah. <coughs> Perhaps one of the only things we remember from 8th grade biology is that DNA doesn't change. All right, when you study DNA. You know, you have this uh, Pfizer, RMA. Oh, they couldn't change your DNA. It can never change your DNA. Your DNA cannot change one. Because then you become God. Okay? It cannot change your DNA one, right? The three billion letters that make up your genome are with you for life, a master blueprint handed down from your parents. But not everything about your genes operate is programmed at birth. Simon Gregory, an associate professor of medical genetics and co-director of Duke Epigenetics, an epigenomics program explained. Now, I send this to my son for him to bet through lah, because he studied all this, so uh, at least uh, he, can, he can help to explain to me. While the sequence of DNA may not be affected by your environment, the ways gene works called gene expression can. Think of DNA as a computer hardware. There may be several types of programs that regulate what the hardware does. Your DNA don't change. But the things that are around affect how your DNA works. That's what I mean. Not change, works. There, uh, there may be several types of software programs that regulate what the hardware does. Epigenetics is the study of heritable changes in gene expression that don't involve changing the underlying DNA effectively, software changes that cause alteration in the gene function. This function not change the DNA, cannot be changed. Now, environmental factors such as food, drugs, exposure to toxins can cause epigenetic changes by altering the way molecules bind to the DNA or changing the structure of the proteins that DNA wraps around. Okay? These structural changes can result in slight changes in gene activity. Not change gene, gene activity. They can also can produce more dramatic changes by switching genes on 
when they should be off or vice versa. For example, there is a sickness called muscular dystrophy. Muscular dystrophy uh, is a sickness that causes degeneration of the muscle. Somehow, women are carriers of this def gene defect, but they are not full-blown. Only men are full-blown. There are some women very scared. Very few women actually have uh, muscular dystrophy. There, but generally, no. So it's always the male that is affected. Okay? So depending on various factors here, these genes exist, but it's not activated. But it can be activated by environment, by stressful situation, all that. So there are some people, some men who carry the genes, but they do not have full-blown. But then their children, full-blown. That's why I'm trying to say that how the gene, even though there's a negative gene, it doesn't mean that it works all the time. It's how you kickstart that particular gene. So the environment can affect, the food you eat can affect, etc., etc. It's called a switching of the genes on or off. I think the, the medical people are trying to switch off certain genes, the old age gene they're looking at. Which gene causes old age? If they can switch it off, we all can live to 1,000 years old without, without, uh, without getting old, right? So it's a switching of the genes. So your environment can switch certain genes that is in you. Okay? Let me continue. This is actually the most important part for us uh, unfortunately, the young people are not here. If they learn it, next time they will know. When they have children, when they are pregnant, they will know what to do. Now, these changes are heritable, meaning they can be passed on from parent cell to daughter cell within the body and from the parent to child. An extraordinary study of survivors of the Dutch famine during the World War II, for example, has shown that the effect of epigenetic changes caused by hunger doesn't show up in the survivor's children, but they do in their children's children. That means there's a jump of one generation. All right? The grandparents, the children don't have. All right? It's the grandchildren. So the gene is there, but the children somehow don't have, but the grandchildren have. All right? This is a study done. Um, so you, so this perhaps suggests the adage should not merely be you are what you eat, but also, you are what your grandparents eat. Okay, because you all pass down, the genes all pass down. All right? So, in connection, every bit of gene information is present in the single cell. So, if you want to read more, I've given you the website to go and read in greater detail. Or else we go into it, we have no time. Okay? No one can change the gene, but gene function or activity can be affected by other factors. The DNA of the child determines certain characteristics of the child, such as the color of the hair, the eye, the skin, the height, the body shape, and inborn talents, for example. Some of us have got black eye pupil, some of us got brown eye pupil, some of us got purple eye pupil. Purple, you put a lens now. <laughs> all right, so our color and all that is determined by the genes. You cannot run away. The genes combination. Norm, generally, the stronger gene takes prominence, isn't it? Normally, right? Uh, but sometimes it's, it's different. Huh? Like, for example, if I look at the character traits of my two children, huh? even though we're married, right? Uh, one character trait takes after me and one character trait takes after the mother. My youngest son takes after the mother, my eldest son takes after me, which is not very good. <laughs> takes after the mother is better because the mother's family environment is better than my family environment when I grow up. Because I grew up in a broken home environment. So that's why you can see it's different. My character is different. My management of emotion is different. Because I don't grow up in a stable environment. For my wife, all the brothers are very stable. Very stable. Alright, so that's, that's very important. So I hope my eldest son takes after my wife, but he didn't take after me. So... Um, so that's what I'm, I'm trying to say. But even though I got strong personality, somehow it happens that the young one takes after uh, the mother's personality. Uh, steady, calm, no, no problem. Huh? You want to get her to get angry means something must be very bad. If you get very angry, you're in trouble. If you get me very angry, it's okay. Because after that, I finish already. Okay? Now, so... It also established certain traits of the child according to the generations. 
Certain people are predisposed to peculiar traits seen running through the generations. I see this trait in my father's generation, for example. All my uncles, every one of them are polygamists. Okay, all of them are polygamists. I included my father lah, from polygamists. I see some of my cousins are polygamists in my own home. Right? At least one of them are polygamists, my own sibling. So you have this problem. You, this runs in the, the family environment and the traits, you see. So by God's mercy, he set me free from this trait. If not because of God, huh? I may be a polygamist. You may be number one, I got number two, number three, number four. All right, so well, by God's grace, huh? and I, I thank God that I cut off that trait in my family. Because some family, as I read on, you begin to see, huh? some people are predisposed to depression and mental illness, while others to moral sins. See? Right? It's gene, ma, genetic. Ma. And then the environment. Ah. You see all your uncle polygamists, what happened to you? You think that is normal. What? That's why modeling is very important. That's why I don't allow my brother who is a polygamist to come to my house. Some people, you're so strict. Why? I say, no, why? Because if I let him come to my house, what, am I, what message am I sending to my children? What am I sending to my children? It's okay to be a polygamist. Some people say, you are so hard on your brother. I say, no, it's for my children's protection. If you don't know how to behave, don't come to my house. Because to me, the most important is my family. My sibling is secondary, isn't it? Alright, so some people say, oh, you're so strict. I say, yeah, because if you don't send a message, they think it's okay, ma. That is okay, ma. Uncle polygamist, that's see, except see eating, la, having fun. La. So it's okay to be a polygamist. No, I'm very strict. I said, no, you don't come to my house. And I warned you and I told you before, this is your, your life, this is what you want to do, is your business nothing to do with me. I don't want you, what you do, affect my generation and my children's generation. I don't want that. You don't come. So some people think that it's a bit hard, but it's up to people. Lah. If other people, like my brothers, I tell my brothers, you know, they, they have a good time eating together. And then what, what about your, what is your children thinking? It's okay, ma. To be a polygamy, what's the problem? Okay, ma. Everything is okay. No. It's very clear. I don't allow that. All right? Because people learn from example. Where am I now? Huh? <laughs> All right. Okay. So, some people are predisposed to depression and mental issues, but others to moral sin. We see this reality in the life of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The same sins run through the generations. Okay? Same sin run through the generation. They all committed the same sin, which was lying. They are great liars. And they know how to lie. All right? And so what happened is, as the baby begin to develop, the cells begin to divide. By week four, the baby grows one million cells per second. You imagine how God created human being. Incredible, you no? Know? One million cells per second. The heart and the brain are visible by week four. What is the abortion? Six weeks, is it? The maximum. That means they are heart already pumping, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. The heart and the brain are visible. Research reveals that the right environment in the womb will switch on the good genes and the negative environment will switch on the negative genes. That's why you have some people very bad temper and all this. These are all switch on now when they are growing up because they grow up in an abusive home, you know, in all those angry environments. They switch all the negative genes. That's why the environment becomes very important. Uh, it, it is very important. Hence, it is imperative. That means it is important that when the baby is growing in the womb, don't wait until the baby is born, but in the womb. All right? It is imperative when the baby is growing in the womb, the mother-to-be must not be exposed to stressful environment. Whether it's in relationship or in the home, or in the office, if she is working or in business, or she involved in business. That means the baby growing in the womb, the mother's environment in the womb is very important. If she's working in a very stressful office, it affects the development of the baby. Okay? 
babies who are born to a woman abandoned by their spouses or boyfriends experience extreme stress growing in the womb and the negative environment switches on the negative genes. Do you know when a, 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 a woman is pregnant and then being abandoned by the husband or by a boyfriend, uh, the baby, she's very stressed and the baby growing is under a lot of stress, you know. And that is not good for the baby. Okay? If such a situation happens, then what happens? Then somebody must fit in the role, no, to, to make sure that the environment is minimized. How do they do it? If such a situation happens, then the role played by the immediate family become extremely important. So when a woman, a girl is pregnant by somebody not married, and then the parents become very angry, they don't care, they don't bother, the, the girl becomes even more stressed. And sometimes they get pregnant not because of anything, because of mistakes, it can happen. And so the parents must step in to provide the right environment for the baby to grow in the right environment. So they must step in to alleviate the negative environment. I know most parents become very angry, but they need to settle down. Uh, they need to settle down. Uh. Don't start keeping it too long you know, because it affects the baby. They tend to be very difficult to care and manage. Do you know that baby who are uh, developing in the womb of a mother who is very stressful, finding it very difficult to manage when they are born. Very difficult. Okay? And then if, they are, they are, if the mother is always very fearful when the baby is in the womb, uh, the baby becomes very difficult to manage when they are born because they are, they are filled with the spirit, negative spirit of fear and all that, you see. So it becomes very difficult. Generally, they also develop very unstable emotions and more susceptible to anxiety and depression in the future. This is further exacerbated by the external environment later during the baby's first three years of growth. So you have the growth in the womb, and then after that, the first three years after the baby is born. All right, so it's a very negative environment in the womb, and the baby born, the first three years, also very abusive, very negative environment. It affects the child's development. Now I want to look at the womb environment, uh, the womb environment, development of the fetus. Uh. Number one, baby's brain development. By week four to five, the brain grows 100,000 cells each minute. Babies are not born with an empty slate, as I mentioned, and many believe. A baby's brain begins to receive information throughout the brain development during the pregnancy. Okay, understand that. During the pregnancy, not just when the baby is born only they No. Brain development can be damaged. Brain development can be damaged by number one, the food, drink, and drugs consumed by the mother. Two, the environment in the womb. Three, the environment of the marriage. If they have a terrible marriage, arguing and fighting all the time, when the baby is in the womb, you're going to have a problem, very negative environment. The environment in the family and extended family. So you have within family all fighting, all negative. And then the environment at work, if the wife or the mother is working in a very stressful environment, my recommendation is that they should take sabbatical leave. And then you have the environment in business, you're involved in business, especially you have a baby in the womb, you're involved in business and the company is not doing well, maybe on the verge of bankruptcy, trying to sort out all this. So you are stressed, when you are stressed, the baby is stressed. And then the last one, the external environment. Okay? Now, many people are ignorant that the environment in the womb, during the womb's development, was great impact on the development of the child. Research by Harvard University and MIT has proven that ADHD, some of you have know what ADHD is, huh? uh, autism. is ADHD, yeah? one of them is autism, right? Under ADHD, is it? I think so. Uh. All right. Asthma, or oh no, ADHD is uh, people with very high, what do you call that? Hyper, yeah, hyper. And then asthma, those child born with asthma and autism in a child are caused by the environment in the womb, the mental and emotional condition of the mother. Although 
the ADHD Institute states that it is suggested that both genetic and environment factors play a major role. So, some of child are aut autistic, not because they take an injection called what? Boy chase girl, BCG. Right? Not because of that. Huh? Some people say, oh, they take the injection, they're autistic. But it, it is the possibility from the study is that the condition of the womb is the child. Some of them born with asthma. Uh, it could be the condition in the womb and the child is under stress. You know, my son, when he's under stress, uh, he gets asthma. My elder son, uh, he doesn't have that before, but it was developed through the working. When one of the company he worked, he was under a lot of stress and he developed asthma. No, it's not true. He was never had asthma before. You see, even adult can develop asthma when they're under stress, but if a parent is under stress, a mother is under stress with a baby developing, you find that uh, you can, uh, not mangtanga, you cannot breathe uh, because you're under a lot of stress. And the father also put a lot of stress on him, you see. Uh, so, uh, so this is important. Uh, so when a mother is experiencing continuous stress, either due to work pressure, stress or distress and tension in marriage, an extended family relationship or finance, the emotional turmoil of the mother will impede the normal brain development in the baby. Now, how I wish I learned all this when I was young. And some of you now are benefit to it, and I know that your next generation definitely will be better when you apply it, not just knowing that when you apply it. This is so important. The environment in the womb and the first three years, remember, most parents get uh, serious after the baby is born. No, when the baby is in the womb, you need to start. Right? In the first three years of the baby's growth, besides parenting models, determine the cognitive, the mental, the emotional, the character, and the academic of the child in the early years. All right, let's go on to the natural environment of growing up years. What I did was the development of the baby in the womb. Now I'm going to the growing up years. That means the baby is now born. Now you have the external environment. Okay? So I was looking at the growing up years. The first three years of the child's development are crucial. These are the peak years of brain development. Everything that affects the child from the womb and the natural environment in the first three years affect the child in his middle years, in his adolescence, and in his adulthood. Many people think that the child only learns when the child is born, and that is incorrect. Research has demonstrated that in the first three years of the baby's development, it begins in the womb. 700 synaptic connections between the neurons are made every second in the brain. The rate of growth is not matched at any other time during the child's life span. By the end of the third year, the brain has developed to 80% of the adult brain. So your brain cells are having a connection. If there's no connection, your brain cells don't work. So the connection is called a synaptic connection. That is very important. That's why when a child never sees light, the synaptic connection is not connected and that is blind. Okay? The experiences and interaction of the child leading to connections being formed between the neurons. We do not want the connections to be made quantity, but it is also important for the connection to be strengthened quality. So you want the connections, a lot of them, but you also want the connection to be strong, not just a lot of them. A lot of them, not strong, also no use. So you have the neurons and then you have the connection. So you want a lot of connections and then you also want the connection to be strong. That's what you want to do. Okay? What affects the rate of growth, that means the quantity of connection and the strength or the quality of the connection. So you have the quantity and you want to have the quality. What affects this? It is the relationship and attachment experienced by the child which influences the quantity and the quality of the synaptic connections. 
it also either enhances or weakens the strength of the connection. If the child experiences negative relationship and attachment and is exposed to negative and sometimes toxic environment, it will affect not only the quantity of the growth of the synaptic connections, but also the quality of whether the connections are weak or enhanced. So the environment. Is it toxic environment, abusive environment? All these affect the quantity and the quality of the connection to the neurons. If a child grows in a stressful environment in the womb, a chaotic, abusive home environment that leads to toxic stress in the child. At that time, when the brain is developing at its highest level, remember the first three years from the womb, the first three years, the brain is developing at the highest level. You want the quantity of connection and you want the quality of the connection to be there the first three years. That means I exclude the nine months, ah, but the nine months also have to because that's where the brain starts. So it's three years and nine months. Okay? So at the time when the brain is developing at its highest, if the child is growing up in a stressful environment, the toxic stress that builds up causes the body to produce cortisol. What is cortisol? It is the body's main stress hormone. It works with certain parts of the brain to control mood, motivation and fear. The adrenal glands, which is the triangle-shaped organs at the top of your kidneys, make cortisol. We all need cortisol. Too little or too much can cause harm to the body. For a child, if the cortisol level is consistently high, it kills the brain cells. Now you know why it's so important, the environment in the home. Okay, it kills the brain cells. Not just the synaptic connection, even the neurons in the brain cell is killed. Okay? If the child experiences toxic stress, this is very dangerous to the child's brain. The best way to nurture brain development is through relationship and attachment. Besides this, besides relationship and attachment, the child must be exposed to a play environment, a learning environment, a creative environment, an innovative environment, an exploratory environment and a happy environment. All these are very important. Okay? It is important to create this environment for a growing child. You can see the impact of these environments on the development of the baby. We keep track of our granddaughter's development. These environments working in unison with relationship and attachment stimulates brain development and the child thrives. Remember, relationship and attachment influences the quantity and the quality of the growth of synaptic connections where else the environment affects other developments such as mental, cognitive, emotional, behavioral, attitude, manners, creativity, innovative, exploratory, confidence, and academic outcome. So you have two. One is attachment and relationship. The other is environment. So there are two. The development trajectory of a child is usually in the first three years of the child's life. So if I may add, three years, nine months. Huh? The nine months during in the womb pregnancy. Unfortunately, most parents focus on the child when he starts school, isn't it? Oh, only school in here. No, 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 no. It has to be from the beginning in the womb. All right? Uh, if parents, due to their ignorance, miss this golden opportunity, that means the first three and a half, nine months, never bother much with the child, is there any recourse? Is there any way? Now, it is not the end of the world, except the parents would have to work very much harder compared to others, isn't it? It's not at the end of the world, all right? Babies, toddlers, and young children learn from the environment through seeing, hearing, touching, tone of voice, 
eye contact and body language and can sense emotions better than us. Children are unique and therefore not everyone grows in the same way. So don't be so worried, you know, when somebody's child who is three and a half years old, they can start reading and your child at four years old cannot read. Don't worry about it because why? Each child is unique. I have seen it in my granddaughter. I tried to teach her. We do reading for her, but she's not wanting to read. And every time we read a story for her and try to teach her, she will stop us after one page and she will say, I am the teacher, you listen to me, and she tell her own story. I cannot get her to read a book because why she interrupt me and say, no, 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 no. I teach her, I tell the story. So she will tell her own story. But do you stop her? No. Why? Because she's creative. You don't want to rush teaching her ABC. Some parents, oh, so young, must teach ABC. She doesn't really know all the ABC until she was about almost four, right? Because we also didn't spend time sitting her, teaching her. We don't. We let her first four years, we let her. We create an environment of innovation, creativity, right? And all that. We don't rush her to do. Why? ABC is very easy to learn. Why you want to rush her? And only when they are young. So you, you, when you do that, you are conditioning her to one mind. So we didn't do that until when she's about four, which is now she can read already. Now she's interested to read, she reads by herself. You see, so you don't compare children. Some, some parents want their children to be genius. I say, I don't need genius. You know, genius are peculiar people. <laughs> I want people who are smart, intelligent, wise, and normal. Not genius. I don't want genius. Okay? So don't compare children because some children are better in certain areas. My granddaughter is not active. Some children are very active. My, one of my church members, the grandson is very active because he's a boy. Ma, and then he has teachers here, he has teachers here because he run and he fall the way he run. But my granddaughter don't do it because we always tell her, you are a lady. When you are a lady, you talk differently. Alright? So she doesn't run. And then my, my daughter-in-law was worried she doesn't jump like other children. I said, you wait, why are you so worried? Now she's starting to jump already. Why? Because different children have different traits and different makeup. You understand? Not everybody is a runner, ma, correct or not? Some are trained to be a runner. My granddaughter is not a runner, ma. But every child has special gifting. We need to find out. That's why you don't want to compare. You know, some people... They, are, they always think that, oh, my son now only got 5A and not 10As, you know. And then they start getting worried, you know, and start pushing the child. But they're not academic people. Not everybody's academic, ma. But do you know that? Who is the boss? Normally those not very smart academic are boss, you know. Correct or not? You can have 10 A's at the end of the day. You're working with somebody with two A's only. You know what I'm trying to say? So not necessarily, you know, let the child develop. You know, and make sure that you give them room to develop into what God has for them. All right, not for you. Don't compare. I always tell them, don't need to compare. They're all different, you know. Not the same. So, children are unique and therefore not everyone grows in the same way. So, please don't go around and compare them. I know a lot of parents, they compare their children and force their children under a lot of stress. You know? My son, my friend's son now got nine A's, you only seven A's, useless. I remember my son was, refer, uh, was uh, talking to me after the SPM. After the SPM, you know. And this boy is, is very good. He expected him nine A's. He was saying, I expect him to have nine A's. Huh? And then when my son had SPM, you know, I tell my son, I said, no need to have the nine A's. Huh? What do you want to study? Oh, I want to study medicine. Okay, 7A, enough already. All the science A, the two men's A, English A, good enough already. And so when he had his XPM, his result came out, gave me the paper, 7A's. Because ah. that's what I want. That's it, ma. Enough, lah. So what? Still can go to medical school, what? What's the difference? No difference except no scholarship, lah. No scholarship God can provide, lah. Don't worry. You know what I'm trying to say? And then he was relating to me. One mother came with a son, you know, and he only got eight days, not nine eight. In front of his friend, he started scolding the son, you know, you are useless, uh, no useless, uh, da, 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 da. you see? Hey, the, 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 the child also have pride or no? You destroy the pride. Right? So not everybody is a 10A fellow, no. But I always tell people, don't worry, la. you know, at the end of the day, you do your best. Isn't it? That's what we want. Uh. You do your 
best. That's it. Don't force your children, you know, because then they go in, sometimes they go into mental breakdown. No? So we are all different. Don't worry about it. God is a fair God. God created us all differently with different gifting to him. All right? So don't go around and compare because each children manifest different interests. This is some people 100 meter runner, some people 400 meter runner, some people don't want to run, they want to be swimmer, some people want to be gymnastic. We are different. Ma. If everybody is a runner, it becomes very boring in the world. Right? So no need to compare. And just, just make sure that you know your child's gifting and what they are. That's all. All right, don't worry. As long as they are not drug addicts, as long as they are not gamblers, and all this, you don't have to worry. Okay? All right. Now, so some may be creative, others are more active. You know, they feel the sun, you go to the playground, some of them have this metal cube, you climb, you climb. My granddaughter don't climb one, no. But other child climbing, and then something, I know, you know. You see, it's different. You see, some child are cautious. My elder son is a very cautious person. When you go to the, uh, a place where you have playground, you know they have a lot of these plastic balls, big plate, plastic ball, a lot of child go in and jump into it, right? My, child, my elder son never do that. And he put his feet there. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> so he's not a risk taker, you understand? You know, some are risk takers, some don't care, just jump in. You know? They don't know where the depth is, but he knows, no, this one, huh? Cannot be trusted, no. Don't know how far is it. You see, uh, so it's different. And my granddaughter is also the same. She assesses things before she does it. All right? But some don't, uh, but they're created that way. Uh, you cannot twist and change them. You understand? No. So you don't. You see, let your child develop as they are. God created them that way, okay? So I said some are more creative. Others are more active. Some are problem solvers. Even when they are around two years old. So I'm sharing my experience with you as a primary caregiver for my granddaughter. These are important areas we have to pay particular attention if you are grandparent and you are going to be the principal caregiver. These are the things you need to know. So my granddaughter is a problem solver. How do I know? I share with you, how do I know? Before she was probably about 16 to 18 months, the only regret I have taking care of my granddaughters. I did not keep a journal. You should keep a journal. All right? Keep a journal. At this month, what is she doing? At this month, you keep a journal, then you know. So I cannot give you an exact date because I didn't keep a journal. So I can only give you roughly. Between 16 months to 18 months, she already developed problem-solving skill. Okay? How do I know that? Whenever she comes across an obstruction, for example... She cannot reach the ball. She's praying with the ball and the ball went down under the table, for example. All right? She cannot reach the ball because of the obstruction. What do we do? We will wait and we will see what she does. What will some grandparents do? <laughs> Cry or not? Cry or not? No, we sit and then we wait and we want to see what she does. Okay? Some toddlers would give up and cry. Cry or not? Oh, okay. <laughs> right, right? Some toddlers do that, right? Okay? Uh, often the caregiver will just intervene to remove the extraction and relieve the, retrieve the ball and give it to the toddler, isn't it? Most grandparents will do that, right? Go and take the ball, give it to them, right? Okay? But because we sit down and see what she does, so we observe what she's doing, my granddaughter will find a way around it. As I said, she developed problem-solving skill. If she cannot reach the ball with her hand, she will use her legs. Okay? Or if she, or she will go around the obstruction. If the leg cannot, she will find a way of the obstruction, see whether she can get uh, the ball or not. You see, that is beginning to see at this age, she has this problem-solving skill. This cannot teach her now. This is how much it's built. All right? And we create an environment for that. Because some parents are overprotective, everything they do for the child, they do for the child. So they never develop right critical thinking and, and things like that, you see? All right? One time, as she was playing with the ball, the ball rolled under the bed. She could not reach it with her hand, and then she used her legs, but could not reach the ball. What she did next surprised us. 
she lay down on her back, move her body under the bed, and use her legs to receive retrieve the ball. Now you can see, isn't a problem solving skill? She cannot reach now, so she lie down a bit and go inside and use her leg to kick. So now you can see that she has a problem solving skill being developed. But you also need to help them because some parents they don't help them to develop it. They intervene straight away. Oh, the boy, they are, take the boy and give to them. Don't do that. Just sit and wait and see what the child does. Help the child to develop skills. Okay? And that's why some children, when you talk about hands, uh, what you call hands-on skill, they're very poor. I know of one uh, person, he's very smart, but his hands-on skill is very poor. So when he registered to do medical study, I tell myself he's going to have problem in his clinical and it proved correct. He failed his clinical. Why? Because he doesn't, he can have the brain, but I, his hands-on skill is bad because they never develop. We only talk about oh, study, study, study. Whereas, you know, my younger son, he, he, he fixed his own computer at the age of 14. All right, so this uh, is a very important uh, for us to help our children, our grandchildren to develop certain skills, you see. Uh, so, all right. So allow, allow the toddler to explore, allow the toddler to be creative, and allow the toddler to be innovative. Refrain from being overprotective. When a toddler confronts a problem in play, don't solve the problem straight away for him or for her. Wait and see what he or she is going to do. When the child is exasperated, when they want to give up, then you come in, right? All right, you come in. When the child is ex exasperated, you come in, then you guide him. Don't do it for him. You guide him. Do not solve it for him, but solve it together with him. But you know, all this kind of thing takes time, you know. But if you're a grandparent, you're not working, you've got a time lah. You know what I'm trying to say, you know. My son and my daughter-in-law will not have the time to do it. So we have to play the role. But if you want to keep making some more money, keep working, then you pay the price. You know, everything we do in life, all right, is positive and negative. It's positive and negative. Like one of my friends, already enough money, keep making money, keep making money, but the children's marriage is in trouble, the grandchildren is in trouble. Yeah, you got a lot of money, but look at it. You know what I'm trying to say? So it must be a balance. Your children cannot do it just like we are because we were busy, but you can play the role. But many of my friends are not willing to play the role. Because actually, it's not easy when you reach a certain age. You tell my wife and I, it's not easy, you know, it's very tiring, especially when when they are very demanding, you know. When you have one child, it's a problem. They all don't understand. When they have one child, who is their playmate? It's either Gong Gong or Popo. Oh no, this is my granddaughter play, uh, play by herself. She said, Gong Gong, come play with me, come play with me. But she doesn't know Gong Gong is 66 years old, no. <laughs> when you don't have another child to play with, this is the problem. You understand? We are not so young all the time, you know. Okay? So, uh, so please bear, please, uh, so please bear in mind, and I always stress, uh, please bear in mind that children are different, and, but they do share some common traits. My only regret was, I did, as I say, I did not write a journal of my granddaughter's development milestone. Uh, learn from me, don't regret. Write it down. When she starts walking, when she starts eating, and all that, then it will help you see how she actually developed. So I could write something if I had done that, but I didn't write. This is my, that's, my, uh, that's my regret. But uh, I thought I can do it with my second son's children, but they told us, that said, no need. they said, no need, you know, that when we are married, we take care of our own children. I said, okay, never mind. All right, so we have a look at that. And now let's go to languages. Now we're going to languages. A baby's vocabulary is basically empty. Okay? She picks up words and different languages. If you speak English, you speak Mandarin or dialects at home, and that is very good. Remember, the more languages you speak at home, the better for the child to develop speech and language skill in the brain. So you lose out if it's only a monolingual. Okay? 
So you can decide, one speak English, one speak Mandarin. The popo can speak dialects. All right, so they don't realize that the more exposure of different language for the child, it benefits the child because there's a development of language skill in the brain. Okay? So she picks up words in different languages, English, Mandarin, even dialects, which are spoken at home or in mobile conversation. When you are speaking on your phone, be careful. They are picking it up and they're using the same word that you use. You think you, they're not picking up, they're picking up. Huh? Mobile conversation and also um, uh, reading, videos and songs. They're picking up those languages, okay? That is how she builds her vocabulary and we marvel among ourselves at the words she used in a communication with us. Uh, we just had a friend from uh, Australia, Perth, last week. She came and we took them to Bukit Tinggi with my granddaughter and he was surprised. This is your granddaughter. English is so good, very good. I said I exposed her to Paddington Bear and Peppa Pig and she speaks like an English man, an English woman. Because why? She doesn't only pick up the word, but she also pick up the slang. So my friends say, how come your, daughter, your granddaughter grew up in England? I say, no. She grew up with Pepper Pig and she grew up with Paddington Bear. All right, so these are important. You know, we never teach her, but she picks up. Ma. Even the slang she picks up, all right? So, so what I mean is that, uh, uh, okay. All right, so what she does is this. So she picks it up and then... Uh, she loves singing. She loves singing, by the way. Huh? And she sings uh, at the age of two years old. She creates her own responsive songs. That means she sings one line, she expects you to respond. All right, that's why we are very busy grand grandparents, you know. Uh, she sings one line, she expects you to sing one line, to responsive, all right? So that, in, in a sense, is creativity. You understand? It creates creati creativity. So she creates her responsive songs and she sings one line, and we have to respond in another line. I teach her to pray in the morning, pray for the food, pray for the mother before she goes to work. My son works at home. Huh? This helps her to learn spiritual words like grace, favor, blessing, protection, safety. Uh, I pray for her when she's unwell, and we have created a form of a prayer habit for her, and thus this must continue to be reinforced. Sometimes I forget in my business. I always remind myself. We see this habit uh, this is a habit playing out when she sought prayer, when she feels sick or have stomach ache. Whenever she says, say, go pray for me, go pray for me. Because stomach ache, you say, go pray for me. So in this way, it's cultivating the importance of prayer for her. All right? Um, no, if we don't take care, we don't take care of her, we got time. The parents, we got time. All right? So when she had an ulcer recently in her mouth, uh, she requests me to pray for her several times because one time still painful, ma. still painful, pray again, pray again, pray again, you know. So throughout the day, whenever she experienced pain, hence the choice of words in the home is critical. Unwholesome words such as angry, and I don't like it when I heard my, my daughter-in-law use the word angry. I'm very angry inside, but you cannot say anything, huh? <laughs> you can never, you should never use the word very angry. You, you can use the word, I'm very unhappy. It's different, right? I'm very unhappy. And then as I was sharing what a church member was talking to me, he said, Pastor, I'm so sorry. He said, and now I realize that I should not use the word angry. Right? Use, I'm very unhappy. Don't use the word angry, hate, stupid. And my wife reminded me, I was traveling one day, one of the drivers was so terrible, you know, a stupid, and yeah, later, I think a day later, my granddaughter used the word stupid, I said, where you pick it up from? The gong gong. <laughs> so, so we have to be very careful because depends on the children, some children are very sensitive, they pick up things very easily, you see, and my granddaughter is one of them, so I have to be very careful, stupid, useless, and some parents will say, I don't want you, you are a trouble, and so on, huh? we should be totally avoided. You see, when we are stressed, we cannot control. Though we start scolding, you see, you know. That's why an environment of calm and peace is very important. When you are stressed, please go out, go somewhere, and then come back. Don't stay in the house. All right? So you have language. Let's have five minutes break.
and we go for emotion. I'm only 15 pages or 40 pages, so I don't know how far I'm going to go.
finish at 3.30. If whatever I cannot finish, uh, if uh, Dr. Kwan need me to come and uh, continue, then I do it. Lah. If not, he can do it. Lah. Uh, no, I haven't finished yet. Cannot. Halfway, cannot. I must finish. Cannot, I cannot finish. Uh, I think better. Lah. There's no point halfway. Ah. Huh? Mm, okay. All right. Let's go to... <laughs> yeah. 3.30, nah. no, it's too long, cannot, ah. 3.30, or ah. else oh, too long. Okay, now we talk about emotion, ah. we talk about language, now we talk about emotion. <clears throat> Alright, now, babies pick up unwholesome words, and these words will affect their emotion negatively. You say you're useless, you think that, oh, you think just like that, no, you affect their confidence, you affect their emotion. All right? Don't think that toddlers or young children have no emotion. Okay? They experience hurt and rejection in their early years by your words and action even when they are growing in the womb. If the baby in the womb and it says, I don't want to have you already, I don't want you, they feel rejection is inside already. Okay, so we have to be careful with words. Huh? Babies and young toddlers feel emotions but cannot manage them. They feel it but they cannot manage because they're not uh, matured enough. The, uh, the front part, I heard my son, is the front part of the brain actually is where you have your logic and everything. It's not fully developed, so cannot. Young children cannot differentiate fiction from reality. Uh, many years ago, the Superman's um, uh, 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 story and movie is very common. And I read this a number of years ago, one young boy, I think he's around eight or nine, wearing the uh, parents by the Superman, right? He went up, four story, he jumped. He thought he's Superman. Because children cannot tell the difference between fiction and reality, still young, cannot. They say around 10 to 12 years old, they start beginning to be able to tell the difference between fiction and reality. Okay? It was in the papers, huh, by the way, some years ago. So, they are not conscious of time, neither are they aware of dangers. So, it is futile to be exasperated when you tell the child to wait. You know, I tell my grandchildren to wait, wait. They don't know what is wait. I don't know what is wait. If they want to eat something, they, they will take it. Like, wait, wait, wait. No use. They don't know what is wait. And you get exasperated because they don't know. All right? So, understand, they don't know what is wait. They don't know what is danger. Anything, they will touch. Because they're exploring. It's, understand? They will touch. And so that's why as parents and grandparents, some of the things you need to make sure that it is beyond their reach. For example, electric kettles. I always make sure I push it in that she cannot touch it. But then sometimes when it's a little bit warm, uh, one or twice, maybe one, I put her hand and let her touch it. And then I tell her, hey, this is hot. And she know, oh, this is hot. Yeah, this is hot. So you don't touch. All right? So it is education. Uh, so you have to understand. So <clears throat> when a child is exasperated or stressed or fearful, a child something can be very exasperated, under stress because you're putting too much stress on the child, he will find an escape. See, God created, that's how God created. Yeah? That's why, that's why uh, pain is important. You imagine if you don't feel pain, you put your hand on the boiling water, your hand becomes boiling. So pain is created by God to protect us. Understand? So pain is important. Uh, so that's the same thing. Uh, a child will find a way of escape. So when the child is exasperated or when the child is stressed, he will find a way of escape. How? Some children will cry, some will hide in a corner, giving excuses such as, I want to sleep, this is my granddaughter's escape. We want to do something and then we try to push her, but she is not ready for it. She said, I want to sleep. And now also the same, huh? Now also she's the same. When we try to push her a bit, then she said, excuse her, she said, I'm tired, I want to sleep. It's not a bad thing, but that is the way of escape for the child to know that they cannot manage or so, you see or not. So, I want to sleep. Huh? This is my granddaughter's escape. Lah. Okay? And then when we hear that, don't push anymore, right? Some parents say, what sleep? Sleep. Homework never finished. No, 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 no. 
See, this is a problem. We all tend to do that, right? Your homework never finished. You know, how can you sleep? Do, do, do. But the child cannot, ma. Understand? Then I always wonder. Actually, I always wonder. I asked my son, you know, he's in the Chinese school, you have the Ching Ying Pan. I don't know where they heard of the Ching Ying Pan, right? So I have a friend whose son is also in the Ching Ying Pan, you know. And uh, he was talking to me. He says, do you know, I just want to find out from you, uh, what time your son sleep? Uh? My son has to sleep around 12 o'clock, so much homework. <clears throat> then he asked me, I said, you know, my son already sleep. I think by 9, 10 o'clock he sleep. Uh. I said, my son sleep 10 o'clock. Uh. Well, I don't know, you know, but my son will sleep 12 o'clock. I said, I don't know why. So I never know the reason, but I know one thing. Every morning, he gets very excited. He will get himself and go to school early. Every time he goes to school early. On. So, uh, was it last trip? I think last trip, or uh, uh, last year or the year before I was with him. So, in our, during the dinner, I just asked him a question. Hey, I said, by the way, uh, last time when you were in primary school, uh, I see you, uh, you want to go to school very early, uh, no problem with you, uh, you wake up and go to school. Why, why you go to school so early? He said, I never finished my homework, so I had to go there and <laughs> copy. <laughs> Now I know, now I know why uh, he sleep at 10 o'clock and why he go to school so early, you see. But sometimes, some Chinese school also is too much, uh, too much of homework. Yeah? And in fact, we refused to put him in a Ching Ying Pan until he was in Standard 4. In fact, Standard 2 had to go Ching Ying Pan and we said no. I said no, no, no. Chinese school, uh, I mean one of those top primary school, you know. Standard 2 put Ching Ying Pan, I said no, no. Until Standard 4, the teacher told us, if you don't go to Ching Ying Pan, you cannot go anymore. So we got no choice. Uh. All right? <clears throat> Okay, so they, you cannot exasperate the child. Lah. If he's tired, let him sleep. Lah. All right? But some of the Chinese school is terrible, you know. I tell you, they put so much pressure on them. Right? If you have 98 marks in maths, huh, you still cannot cane, you know. How many cane? Two. Yeah. So my son was telling me, you know, how much I had to endure when I was in the thinking pan, you know. Cannot pretend my Chinese is the worst, you know. I cannot pretend so many times in Chinese. See? But I said, well, you never tell me. He said, if I tell you, I get more scolding. <laughs> because our generation is, that uh, must be the teacher, right? Uh, you must be something wrong. But now you cannot, uh, now you do that. Uh, the parent will come and scold the teacher. It's different, huh? So let's go on to communication in the home. Alright? So we look at languages. Uh, we look at emotion. Now we look at communications in the home. It is important to be conscious of the way we communicate in the home. The manner and the tone we communicate with one another affect the child and she picks up this habit too. So don't argue in front of the child. Sometimes unconsciously I do that. I have to remind myself. Sometimes my, my wife has to remind me. Sometimes you, you're talking to somebody, you got fed up, you know, you raise your voice. All right, so we have to be very conscious, yeah. So don't argue in front of the child. Like if your husband, your parents, don't argue in front of the child. Like you want to argue, go somewhere and argue. Don't argue in front of the child. It causes stress to the child. You don't know the child is stressed when you argue. Why? Because they think they are the cause of your argument. Because they're still child, they don't know yet. So you are the cause. And that's why sometimes you have you find that there are a lot of problems with children grow up in a broken home. Especially when the child is younger, the home is broken. They blame themselves. They think they are the cause of the broken home. You understand? So you have to be very careful. Uh, <clears throat> so during weekends and public holidays, we always have family time together after dinner. La. On Saturday and Sunday, we have together after dinner. No, not so much la, because she's growing up already. So when, when, she talk, when she wants to talk, because we're together, ma, when she wants to talk and we are talking, she will tell us, don't talk. Say, don't talk. As she wants to join in the conversation. Sometimes uh, when she was talking, uh, I interrupted and she would say, please don't talk. I haven't finished. <laughs> so you can see the development of the child. It becomes very confident. She said, don't talk. I haven't finished. She's only three, some, three years plus at a time. Now she can tell me that, oh, don't talk. I haven't finished yet. Okay? So <clears throat> she, she wants to join in the conversation also. And so it is good to cultivate good habits of communication at home. All right, this, this is very important. Uh, sometimes we are not aware. Uh, I mean, if the child grow, if the child grows up with you la, in your house, then you have to be more careful. Or, but if they are not staying with you, it's not so bad. 
But then, you don't know what the parents are doing, you see. And they, are, they did not attend the seminar today. So, you don't know what they are talking. So, it's your job to go back and take the note and tell them, hey, please read it. Lah. It's for their good. Lah. But the read is another thing. Lah. I say, I do a lot of seminar, my children don't read. I say, people, children are benefiting, my children are not benefiting. Ah. Okay, so now you have impact of the home environment. Okay, you have communication at home, then you have the impact of the home environment. <clears throat> the environment will great impact on the child's development, future performance, both academic and career, destiny and future generations. The environment which will result in negative development are, number one, an unloving environment, an uncertain environment, a critical environment, a fearful environment, abusive environment, a stressful environment, a depressive environment, and a disrespectful environment. Sometimes my granddaughter will throw a little bit of tantrum here and there, and we tell her we have to stop her and say, Look, this is not the type of character. It's not good. This behavior is not good. You understand? All right, you don't let her do it. You've got to stop there. Tell her this behavior is, un we use the word, this behavior is unacceptable in our home. May we always tell her, you are a lady. We want you to grow up like a lady. You talk like a lady. Behave like a lady. Okay? Children growing up in this environment, which I mentioned, a critical environment, fearful environment, abusive environment, manifest certain unhealthy characteristics such as, such as rejection, lack of self-esteem, lack of confidence, relationship failures in the future, rebellious, stubbornness, predisposed to depression, addiction, and suicidal tendency, mediocre performance in their study and career. One thing I have learned, which I have regretted, which I've never been taught, is when we too put too much expectation on our children and thinking that they are all A students, you keep pressurizing them, you find that they will grow up to be very unstable emotionally and lack of confidence and they feel rejected. Because a lot of parents, you know, you have this problem. When you have one child with 10 A's, another child with two A's, you show favoritism, and that's very bad. So I put too much thing on my elder son. I'm an engineer by profession. I don't realize that when my son was standard three, some of the mathematical problem is difficult for him. It's very easy for me. And I lose my temper, and he has very poor confidence in solving math problem because of what I did. I'm sharing it with you. Because I'm an engineer by profession. My mathematics is 98 marks on. I say such a simple thing also you cannot do. And then we were also under a very stressful situation. We were under a very stressful situation. So this is very bad. So you don't do that. All right? Not every child, as I say, a genius. So don't put undue pressure on them. Help them to do their best. Okay, and understand that they are young uh, compared to us. I'm teaching my granddaughter. Sometimes I'm also losing a bit of my patience. My, my, my wife will know that. I'm teaching her to read the Ladybird series. Remember, the, those of you who grew up with Ladybird series, 1A, 1B. Now she's reading 1B. Uh, 1B. So I'm going to start her with 2A. All right, and she has the interest now. Last night I tried, got no interest. I said, every time I read with her, I said, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm the teacher. You listen to me. Okay? So now she's actually learning. So it's okay. Lah. I mean, no need to rush. Okay? Emotional suppression or emotional regulation. When a child is in an emotional stress, what do we do? Traditionally, we are taught to suppress the child's emotion instead of teaching the child to regulate his emotion. If the child is angry because you deprive him of his candy, obviously he's angry, right? Correct, right? If you also angry, all right? You want to eat something, your wife don't let you eat, you're also angry, right? Every time I so didn't let me eat, you also get angry. So the child will be angry, right? he wants a candy you don't give to him. But he doesn't know that the candy is bad for his teeth, ma. And some parents are so worried about their teeth. And by the way, their teeth is going to drop off, la. don't worry about it. 
All right, don't worry about it. It's going to drop out. Okay? So, wouldn't you be angry if you're not allowed to do what you want? You'd be angry. You also angry. Right? You think the child cannot get angry? Yeah? Okay? The answer, obviously, is you will be angry instead of punishing him, thus suppressing his anger. You must not get angry. You must not cry. We should be teaching him to self-regulate his anger. This punitive and accusatory attitude does not help the child to self-regulate his emotion. If we act against his anger, we are teaching the child to suppress his emotion, to suppress his anger. This is what almost all parents do and we think the child is being naughty or stubborn. Oh, he's stubborn. I tell you, don't want to. Do no, he's not stubborn. He's behaving normal because he wants the candy you don't give to him. He's angry. But what do we do? We say, you're very stubborn. No. Because natural response. You also the same thing. If you want something I don't give to you, you also get angry, right? So we don't understand, you see, the behavior of children. And then, then you get into trouble. So what do we do? By not, see, this is what almost most parents do. We think they are being naughty, they're being stubborn. By not punishing the child, you don't hold the relationship as ransom to him. You do not use relationship against the child. When you are not punishing the child or treating him, you are not suppressing the child's emotion. Explain to the child why he cannot have the candy. Although he cannot comprehend it, you are building or depositing some message into his brain. Okay? You can give it to him, but you can explain to him. It is not good for you. Too much yesterday, or was yesterday, was it yesterday? No, Friday we went to shopping center. I met one of my, my uh, church member. We had lunch together with my granddaughter on tour, and then we passed a shop selling candy in a big lollipop. She wants to have it. I said, Fukong, I want the lollipop. So I took the lollipop, put it in her hand. I said, this lollipop has a lot of sweet. If you eat this, you have problem with your teeth, then you have toothache and all that. And after that, she don't want you see the point, you know? You give them, why you want to eat the lollipop? Why you take the lollipop for what? It's no good for you. But her parents do that. Eh? So, what happened is, she willingly do one, you understand or not? You understand or not? She want it, but after explaining, telling her what this is, but she willingly don't want it. And then she was walking around and she saw a nice toy, a small nice toy, those princess toys, these people know how to make money. She go there, Kung Kung, can I buy this one? No, all right? Because I didn't give her the sweet. I said, okay. Right, okay. Then instead of I buying and my church member buy for her, it's only about nine ringgit or something. Lah. Okay, lah. You, you, you get what I'm trying to say, you know. Some parents will say, no, it's not no good for you. you know? So she, she's four years plus. Now she begins to rationalize. Lah. After explaining to her and telling her, you know that I put the, you know, I take the lollipop, I put it in her hand, you know. And then I told her, I said, look, this is a lot of sweet. It's not good for your teeth. And then that she don't want. You see, so this is how you teach them to regulate. Instead of punishing, some parents punish them. Uh. No, you don't take. Then if you do it like that, what happens is they feel rejected. After a few times, uh, they will say, oh, you know, Mama, Kung Kung obviously don't want to give me anything. You don't love me. They, they develop that kind of thing, you understand? So you have to learn uh, how to deal with it. Uh. So, all right. So the child responds to energy and the tone as he is to words. In this way, you are not being permissive or are you being demanding. We are teaching the child self-regulation and not suppression. You know, some children, they play tantrum, right? They want something, they go and play tantrum. And what do they do? Because the parents always give in to the tantrum, it always works. So they always throw tantrum. Lah. I still remember one of my, my, my younger son, we were having, we were having uh, dinner outside. I don't know whether we anybody or not. I think it must be with somebody. And he was being very, he was being very naughty, you know. I uh, got a bit fed up with him. So, you know, I took, I took him into my car, went back to the house. I gave him a good one and I come back. Because some parents don't realize that you don't discipline your child in public, they also have face you and all. Do you know or not? They also have pride one. Sometimes we don't understand. 
you need to take the child to the corner and tell the child, oh, I need to take him back home because we're in the restaurant and we're nearby. And I give him a good one, then we come back. You know, some, you know what I saw in one of the videos? The son was very misbehaving in the car and he drove to the side of the road, took the child out and whack him by the side of the road. So what is going to happen is they're not going to have a good relationship, I'm going to tell you that. Because they don't know any better. All right? Uh, so this is very important. Where am I now? All right. So, <clears throat> here. So the child, okay, we are teaching the child self-regulation and not suppression. The child will grow through this stage and it will pass. And this is how self-regulation happens, not by you must not yell, you must not cry, you cannot run, you cannot run. No, that, that is not going to help him. Okay? If a child is crying for attention for some reason and you refuse to pick up the child and suit him, taught by many people, don't spoil the child. No, when the child is in need, he's crying, and you don't let the child cry, ma. He's not spoiling the child because if you don't do it, he'll feel rejection. Okay? So you create a rejection syndrome in the child. When you are stressed and restless, you are sending a message to the child that it is his fault. So learn to teach the child to self-regulate. Because you also will be angry if you want something you, people don't give to you, isn't it? So it's natural for the child to be angry, ma. So it's how you learn to regulate it. All right, let me just finish this part. It, it, it actually it works very well at uh, 3.30 finishing because after this will be the parenting model and we can look at that uh, some other time. Now let me just finish with this. It's help the child development. The last part. And is your computer working? Can you go to the YouTube? Can you go to the YouTube? And I have put in the website there. You can look at the website and put the YouTube later. You can get it ready. Uh, I'm going to show you. That's, that's very important. Huh? So it's called number, number 6D. It's called Five Steps for Brain Building, Serve and Return. I'm going to show you the video. I'm doing this one. Then I'll show you the video, how it is done. It's very important, okay? Now, any principal caregiver, such as parents or grandparents, or family can build a child's brain. Everyday interaction can have a great impact on the brain development of a child starting even before the baby can communicate. Even though they cannot communicate, you start building it. Scientists refer to this as serve and return, like a game of tennis or ping pong. A child served by showing interest in something and the caregiver responds in a supportive way. So it's like a responsive song. Huh? My granddaughter sing a line. They want me to respond. That is serve and return. He's serving to me. I'm returning back. Okay? Simple serve and return interactions between the caregiver and the child help make strong connections in developing games. It is fun and easy to do anytime. It doesn't cost you a lot of money. Anywhere you can do, anytime you can do, anywhere you can do, and does not cost much financially, although it may cost quite a bit of time. The video I'm showing you breaks down the serve and return into five different steps and features the caregiver and the young children doing each step. Many of us are already doing it without realizing it. The five steps are, number one, share the focus. Number two, support and encourage. Number three, name it. Number four, take turns back and forth. And number five, practice ending and beginning. It is best demonstrated in a video. Can you get the uh, YouTube with the... Uh, uh, the site on, and then you can show that, and then I'm going to end uh, 330, which is nice. Okay.
Did you know that you can help build a child's brain? Everyday interactions can have a big impact on developing brains throughout childhood, starting even before babies can talk. Scientists call this serve and return, like a game of tennis or ping pong. A child serves by showing an interest in something, and the adult responds in a supportive way. Finding moments throughout the day to do it is easy and fun, and you'll be building strong brains. You can use five steps to practice serve and return with any child. Step one, share the focus. When a child is interested or curious, you can see it. What's this? It's a stroller. Watch this child look at something in a book. Right there. Pointing shows interest. <gasps> Cow. So does making a sound, like this child. And mom is paying close attention. See baby moving those little arms and legs and focusing on the ball? That's a serve. The key is paying attention to what the child is noticing. Oh, you like those guys too? Look at grandpa sharing the focus. By noticing serves, you will help build curiosity and you'll strengthen your relationship. Step two, support and encourage. You can return a child's serve by saying a word of encouragement. That's right, pretty good. Watch grandpa return this serve Let's by saying thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Even a facial expression can encourage a child. Orange. Or emotion, eight. like this you mom dancing. Time. Eight, eight, eight. You can also pick up the object that the child is pointing to and bring it closer. We need help to sit her down. Need help? Things like helping and playing with a child let them know that their thoughts and feelings are heard and understood. <laughs> Step three, name it. Yeah, the puppy, the puppy. See the windows, the house. When you return a child serve by naming what they are seeing, doing, or feeling, you make important language connections in their brain. He's got bumps all over him, huh? This brain building happens even before a child can talk or understand your words. You can name anything, a person, a thing, an action, a feeling, or a combination. Clean up, clean up, everybody do your shit. When you name what a child is focused on, you help build understanding of the world around us and what to expect from it. The baby's sitting. Ooh, the baby's sitting in the back seat of the car. You like those? Those are raisins. You have raisins all the time. Naming also gives a child words to use later and shows that words are important to you. Step four take turns back and forth. Taking turns helps children learn self-control and how to get along with others. Waiting is crucial. When you return to serve, give the child a chance to respond. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Note that the caregiver waits here for the next serve. See this toddler navigating a new adventure? Grandpa is waiting patiently, returning serves by asking okay. questions and then waiting to see what happens next. Yeah. You want to cover it? Yeah. Are you cold? Yeah. Let me put this over your lap like this, okay? Damn. Do you like that? Yeah. Oh. By waiting, you give the child time to develop ideas and build confidence and independence. Step five, practice endings and beginnings. Children signal when they're done or ready to move on to a new activity. Watch how this child shows it's time to start something new. Letting go of a toy signals an ending. Then picking up a new toy signals the next beginning. Sharing the focus is important in this step. the big eagle. Because this mom is sharing the focus, she notices when her child is ready to end one activity and begin something new. When you can find these moments for a child to take the lead, try this one. you support the child in exploring their world. 
Would you like to play with something else? And make more serve and return interactions possible. Sit there. Serve and return interaction is critical for a child's developing brain. And the best news is that you can do it anytime, anywhere, without any need for toys or technology. Look for small opportunities throughout the day, like while you're making a snack or while you're grocery shopping. What matters most is that you're doing each of these five steps. Notice the serve and share the child's focus of attention. Return the serve by supporting and encouraging. Name it, take turns going back and forth, and practice endings and beginnings. Serve and return interactions make everyday moments fun and become second nature with practice. Try practicing with a child today. When I go to the supermarket, that's what I do. I sit my uh, granddaughter on the trolley. I bring her to all the different vegetables, all the different fruits. I let her touch it feel the texture, name it, you know, and things like that. And sometimes I let her walk. So that's how you develop uh, uh, this uh, particular part of developing the child's brain. But I think you know that it takes time, right? The time is always the issue. Right? It takes time. And when you are at this age, sometimes uh, you're getting a little bit more difficult. All right? So uh, uh, thank you for... Uh, sitting patiently to listen to the seminar today. We will make an arrangement with uh, Dr. Kwan to go into parenting. We've only done on child brain development. We go into parenting, but I want to give you an opportunity. I want to hear from you to come and share after this seminar, how you find the seminar, how you have benefited the seminar, and perhaps you can share some of your own experiences to us. We have about, what, uh, 15 minutes so do come. I need to know uh, what you have picked up, uh, what you have picked up so that uh, uh, then I can replan and what I need to do in the future if I'm doing another one. All right, so I'm going to leave the mic here and I encourage you to come and share your own experience, okay? All right. Hello. Okay, uh, what doctor saying that? Lah? Hello. Okay. So I remember uh, uh, when I was waiting for my SPM result. So the headmaster asked me, uh, he asked me hey, whether you got a job or not. So I said no. So he offered me as a temporary, temporary teacher for a few months while I'm waiting for the results. So uh, I'm teaching remote form one and form two. And um, I remember that one day when I teach uh, form two students, so they asked me, what is the best result to go for university? I say, I, I don't know, I, I'm saying I'm a very lazy guy, not like my, my, my brother. My brother every day reading, I know, I play, <laughs> play badminton. So I told them, to me, like, I will find that like, I agree with what doctor is saying, that not necessarily go for 10 A's. As long as you can go up to university, sufficient result will do. So uh, that's how I, I came across like, to me. Huh? So I agree with uh, Dr. Stephen. Okay, thank you. Hello. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Stephen. Very wonderful of you. And of course, Dr. Kwan. And I would like to share with, you, with all of you, I'm at, at a different level from you because I'm 75 years old. So, why, why? Many people look at me, first thing is they look at my hair. They say, how come you have so much hair? And they say, are you wearing a wig? No, no, no. no. This happened when I, was, when I was a bachelor in Johor Bahru. One day, I was shopping alone, and two or three ladies stopped me by and said, you look like one Hong Kong singer and actor. Do you know who is that? He's still alive. Lam Chi Xiong. Josh Lam. Ah, Josh Lam. Because at that time, I only had a moustache. Like Josh Lam. If you see him on, on YouTube, you think that... They asked me, the, the, the ladies asked me, are you his brother? But because over the years, I had developed this moustache. Moustache, yes. The beard here, because I'm wearing a mask, you can't see. Right? I put, take off, and then you can see my... Right? My beard. So but all now they become white, only the top is black. Many of my retired friends, either they are totally bald, good landing helipad, huh? good for helicopters to land, or at the back, the portion is already barren huh? for a bota. So anyway, they asked me what's my secret and all that. So I told them, be careful with the food that you eat. Too salty will destroy your hair. That's why I'm very careful. Anyway, come back to our topic here. Uh, my three kids, I don't apply any pressure, whether to get 10 A's or whatever. Actually, I'm blessed, my God, of course. That they are, when they are born, they are very smart. I can tell you, my second boy made me worry, not my first boy. When he went to kindergarten, he still couldn't read. You ask my wife. All of us were very worried, can't even read. But the kinder teacher told, told us, don't worry, because he, can, he knows how to recognize the alphabets and all that. Only when he entered primary, he was able to read. And I told Dr. Kwan and Dr. Stephen, they are, he's somebody today. <laughs> All right, okay. Uh, talking about uh, academic achievement, I never, never use pressure that you must or what. No, 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 no. They are born with the gift that, uh, actually, I'm not a very smart guy. Uh, I'm only good in English. Literature, if you ask me about Shakespeare, I can tell you everything, all right? History, anything you ask me. Because why? When I, my history is, of course, A. <laughs> Those days in Cambridge, they don't give you A, they give you one. Uh, one, or you get two, or three, or four, or five, or six. Six is the bottom part, the credit lowers six. If you get seven and eight, it's just an eight, a normal pass. Nine, F9, that is what everybody gets scared, huh? Okay. So my, they, they are excellent students, academic-wise, SPM, 10 A's or so, but no scholarship, no? Uh, you know now, huh? All right. And then they went to S STPM, uh, they went for Form 6. Very fortunate, I don't have to send them for A-level, saved me a lot of money on that, okay? And... With four A's, 4.0, CGPA, four principal A's, huh? all the sciences and maths, they got A's, not B's or C's. So, uh, and in the university, also no problem, right? So I don't use pleas pressure or anything, but I, my environment, my home environment, every cupboard has books, right? All books are around them. And my wife, I really appreciate her. She will take the books and read to them from the very young. 
very young, below three years old, start reading anything, pictures, full of pictures. Huh? And that's all. Uh, I, now, at this senior level, I'm having big, big problem, big issue with my grandchildren. <laughs> with my grandchildren. You see, uh, they, are, they are in Chinese schools. I know one weakness about, because I'm a language teacher, English language, uh, and also history. So I've been trained to teach these two subjects. All right? And, of, and the other thing is, I know how to tackle. Once you know the problem with Chinese school, especially Bahasa, if you have any problems your grandchildren are having, you come and see me. I will guide you. Even though I'm not teaching Bahasa, but along, the, along my career, I've been teaching, I, I taught in government school for 33 years, huh? before I retired, huh? in 2003. Now it's what? 2022. After my retirement, I never stopped working. I continue. Because once you stop working, you stay at home, you are dead. You are dead, you know, not in the sense that, in the sense that what, you become detached from what is happening, curriculum, academic, and all that. You are detached from that. And you will not be very equipped to handle your grandchildren next time. So, anyway, I managed to learn how the UPSR Bahasa is being run. They have a certain format, certain pattern, and I will buy the past year's question and see how they, uh, they how they, uh, what do you call, how they uh, format the questions. First thing, get yourself equipped. Get the past year's question first. Even though you are not a language teacher, if you are a homemaker, you can still do it. But looking at the, at the format itself, you will know. Even in history, I can tell you, huh? some parents came to me for personal tuition for their children. You don't believe me. There's one dato here in Saramban. He sent two boys to me. I have to go to their house. Of course, he pays my transport allowance, petrol. And he asked me, do your best. They are good in history. They are good. The only thing is they want A's. <laughs> That's the problem. Right? They want A's. They want good, good results. So I told him I will do my best. And you don't believe me. The two boys got A in Sajara. Huh? SPM A in Sajara is not easy. Huh? Uh, because a major part of the Sajara paper, I would say about 60% are on Islamic history. You cannot run away from that. No way for you to escape the question on Islamic history, especially in Form 4. Right? Okay. And then uh, coming back to my grandchildren, so I focus what to do, uh, how to settle it. Because I was a, I'm an English teacher. Now I have to switch to Bahasa. So there's, there are no differences. You, I, you can, whether it's Russian or German or anything, the format will be the same. So I realized Chinese, Engl uh, Chinese language, Bahasa, English, the same, same format for Malaysian schools. Get the passage question, then you know what I'm talking about. So anyway, I tackle, tackle the issues from there, and then my granddaughter, who is in Form 1, is because of me. I'm, I'm not saying, I, I'm not boasting or anything. Because of my knowledge, my skills, so I managed to tutor her, and she could go to Form 1 directly instead of going to remote class. Don't ever go to remote class. Please tell your child or whoever grandchildren. Don't ever go there. One whole year in the remote class is very depressing you know, for the for the child. Uh, because I have taught in a remote class before. My career is, I, I'm telling you, I start from the bottom. When I, I, I was in Johor, when I was transferred to another school, you know what the principal said? I want to see you from the remote class and then I'll move you up. He wants to see my, my, what you call, my qualities as a teacher. So finally, I moved up to Form 3 level. Huh? Anyway, 
So that's my grand grandchildren. Now I'm coming to the second one, the grandchild. <coughs> my grandson is going to take the Sender 6 exam. So I'm having problems with him also. <coughs> so anyway, uh, that's, that's all I can tell you at this moment. And thank you for your wonderful uh, uh, lecture. Thank you, everyone. All right. Hey, hi, everyone. Yes, is it very weird, uh, a person that without <laughs> haven't married, although even have a boyfriend, asking? No, I just want to share that actually I am a fruit, a fruit from a suppressing family. Okay, parents non-educated, very suppressing, um, very biased, very um, because of pride, of like you know Bohemian, and they will uh, like um, they treat you like um, something like don't really care of you because I'm not brilliant child. So it's just like you suka bapa, you bapa lah. Okay? And at the same time, because of this kind of patterns, I am, I am a very um, very close kind of people. I would say introvert already. Introvert. So whatever parents say do, I do. Uh, work this, I work this. Um, whatever they say, I just follow. Okay, so there is a damage there. And at the same time, when the relatives saw how the parents treat me, at the same time they also treat me same. And they treat me like I'm. I don't have parents that I'm not born of a parents. You see, I also got parents. You see. Mm. So this is uh, the fruit of being a suppressing parent, me. And I want to ask so many parents here, you see, if you ever that you mistreat your children. I, said, I understand that somehow, like, on the spot, uh, you mistalk or miscommunicate or sometimes throw out the thing that you shouldn't throw out. After that, um, you, you just leave your daughter or son, you know, tomorrow, like, nothing happened again. Ah, hi. But actually, there is a damage there. It's inside, the scar is already there. But can the parents say sorry? Yeah? Or the aunties uh, has um, mistreated you. Can the auntie say sorry, yeah, Pastor? But the scar is still there. You see, parents, uh, um, no matter who, uh, even though your staff, uh, recently I have a staff father passed away. She's so um, mis mis guide, misleading, like, you know, the, the emotional imbalance. So her work is really dropped from, from 80% to 50% to 20%. And now she asked me, uh, I want to uh, get more unpaid leave. So what can I do? I know there's a scar in her. She's, she's coping up because uh, father's passed away. So I, as a manager, I, I cannot, um, you see, of course, your family problem is your problem. Company problem is company problem. Have to separate. But I'm being a Christian, I cannot press her. Because I'm a Christian. And I understand that put a scar in a person's heart is very hard to consult the, the scar. See? It's very hard to stitch back. You see, parents, um, yeah, yeah, even as a kid, maybe um, you don't know things, lah, you know. Now, parents eat salt more than you eat whatever. Lah. <laughs> but, yeah, as a kid, uh, we really need love. Sometimes we work anywhere, so our manager treats us better than the parents at home. And this is very sad. You know? This is really sad. And you can see parents uh, treat the relatives' children uh, better than own children. Oh, you're just like it. Table, ma. Table, ma. So uh, this is what I want to share. Thank you, everyone. Because I have some past year's paper, I, I, 
I taught in an international school, IGC, IGCSE papers, English papers. If you would like to have, because I just retired uh, last year completely, the management stopped it. Actually, I want to continue because the management told me, you are already 70 plus, give to another younger person like you people. So actually, I could continue. In fact, I wish to continue, even if I'm till 80 years old, I think I still can go on. So I have plenty of question papers with mark schemes. Huh? Mark schemes are there. You can tell me, and then I'll bring English paper. But there are two types of English, because I taught two types of English. English as a first language, and English as a second language. So if, if English is not your first language at home, like native speakers of English, you go for second language. So I have taught, I have dealt these two papers with two sets of students, different levels. So please come and tell me if you want the question papers, uh, you have you like to take a look, have a look. By all means, you can keep because I'm about to dispose. I have, you come to my house, I have piles and piles of this past year's paper. First language, second language, plus history, IGCSE. It's a wonderful syllabus. Uh, IGCSE history is wonderful. It's a really a wide-ranging syllabus. Uh, it keeps, it makes you a wholesome person, a holistic person. I mean historical, from the historical perspective. So please let me know. So I put them. Because I'm going to, I'm not about to dispose. I don't know what, what to do with them. Burn them or paper lama, or I feel very, very, very sad. <laughs> so don't be, don't be shy. You can always come in. Huh? Okay, I haven't reached this level yet. I'm 75 years old, so <laughs> I cannot speak so long. Now. But I uh, sincerely appreciate uh, Master Dr. Kevin Chi, giving us such an insight and challenging. But what I like uh, hope to sort of uh, learn in the next session is that what sort of political principle can we apply, you know, in parenting? Because parenting, if you search in the uh, Google or YouTube, uh, you can learn a lot, you know. But that is a worldly way of uh, giving. So I hope uh, I can learn uh, how to do it biblically, using biblical principles, how to instill biblical principles into our children. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Yeah, we'll do it in part two. Parenting part, we'll do it in part two. Yeah. Any more questions? I think the second part is important in parenting. Uh, that's very important. Yeah, to first be a, a learning child development. That is so important. So also that for us to how to uh, parenting our children. Amen. So if you none, then the, any more, if none, then you can close. It's already 3.30. Yeah. Let's pray. Remember, next time, next section, you all must come. Huh? Parenting is more important. Huh? Okay, praise the Lord. Amen. Father, I thank you for this wonderful time that you sent uh, Reverend Stephen T. and the wife for us and to learn about this parenting. Father, we know that, Lord, uh, you, you con uh, we pray that you continue to use him in this area. He will go around uh, instilling this to the, all the Christian community uh, churches because that is important. If Christians do know how to become a good parent, I don't know how the world will become. Yeah? So we are the light of this world and salt of the earth. Father, let this, uh, uh, your servant, uh, Reverend Stuensky, continue this work. I know it's not easy. Uh, it's uh, time-consuming, but he is giving the strength that he needs. Give him the anointing. Give him the, uh, what I call the support system or, or resources that he needs, Lord. We thank you for uh, through this afternoon. Truly, we are enriched. Truly, we are uh, educated uh, uh, by this uh, training seminar. Father, we continue to uh, pursue this because family is what God has given to us, what God has created. It's so important. We need to preserve uh, the family, Father, because at the end of the day, we need to give account to God for our uh, parenting, uh, for our family intact, uh, for our family safety, or uh, family health. Father, all this you require from us because you created a family, not another person. We thank you, praise you. Send us home with your presence. Send us home with your 
uh, this wonderful knowledge of the parenting. We ask you to bless each one of us. Thank you that, Lord, we are here. Even in the Saturday afternoon, we can do other things, but we are choose to be here. You bless each one of us. We thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, we ask and pray. May God's people say, Amen and Amen. And God bless all of us. Had a wonderful uh, Sabbath. <laughs> Still young the day. <laughs>